Talk Daily with Andrew Hustler Patterson and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, gang? Huss here, Michael Remus, Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Let's get it on. Pack show today. The latest from Winnipeg Jet training camp heading into tomorrow's preseason finale at home with the Ottawa Senators. The latest from Winnipeg Jets practice, including how the lines are looking for what will be the true dress rehearsal for the Winnipeg Jets against Ottawa. Defense pairings, which I know you're going to be excited to hear about. And we'll also hear from Rick Bonus on Nikolai Ehlers' status and more. Um, With NHL beginning in earnest next week, thought it'd be a great time to look ahead to the season. With Greg Wyshynski from ESPN, we'll also have an extended Jets chat on uh, Philly Hainala's chances of making the team, tomorrow's game, and an outlook for 23-24 with Murata Tesh of The Athletic. And then a little later on, we're not forgetting about the blue and gold. Bombers back on the practice field today, getting ready for the biggest game of the season, Friday night in BC with the Western Division title all but on the line. Um, Going to be a great show. Awesome to have everybody with us. Um, shout out to everybody in chat, as always. And a big thanks to uh, a few new subscribers. Folks, we're creeping up there. We've been saying for the last month or so, our goal was to get to 10,000 subscribers by the drop of the puck on October 11th. And we are now less than 30 away. So if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button. And while you're at it, hit the thumbs up for the uh, for today's video. And uh, as always, I know so many of you uh, support us so well. Tell a friend about Winnipeg Sports Talk. Get in. Be part of the first 10K for WST on uh, on YouTube. All right. I'm um, just going to bring Michael Remus in and get to it. We obviously are going to start off with a quick reaction to the Blue Jays loss yesterday and talk about yet to, to this afternoon's game. But a big thanks to the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Cool Bet Canada, Princess Auto, Vita Health Fresh Market, Wallace & Wallace, F Apparel, Nick & Nicky DQ Group, Modern Man Barbershop, Aquatech, Manitoba Battery, Canadian Club, Consolidated Supply, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, Little Brown Jug, and don't forget the Winnipeg Jets and our four-game pack. Still time to get in on that. We've got new seats open over in Section 317. Check the link in the description, or if you're listening on the podcast, go to winnipegsportstalk.com and hit that link and uh, join us beginning on October 17th for our first of four great games. Let's get Remo in here and get this thing going. What is up? I'm feeling good. We've got uh, Jets lines from practice where everyone is feeling good, Huss. So uh, uh, it's great, great news. You know who's feeling good in the chat right now? Hmm. MC Stormy, Bruce H., and the rest of the Twins fans in the uh, (laughs) chat today. Blue Jays fans, not as fired up or excited. I was talking with Dusty on the lock shop last hour on this one, Reem, but... uh, Man, that was excruciating yesterday. I mean, it just seemed like a microcosm of what we've seen from this team for 162 games. Some pretty solid pitching. The bullpen came in and did the job and kept them in, and they just were not able to generate the offense to win a game that they needed to have. And uh, backs against the wall today with former twin Barrios on the hill. It's crazy to think, you know, two years in a row with playoff appearances that could last... Less than 24 hours. This new wild card format. You just play, what, three in one city last year. The sweep by Seattle. And this year, you're going to Minnesota. You think you got a good shot. And if you score one run, you're not going to win too many games. They only gave up, gave up uh, three. And, you know, you, like your guys can't hit. You're making base running errors like uh, Bo Bichette. Not helpful. So, um, you know, you're going to have to see what happens. The bats are going to have to step up. We talked about it coming in. They need to get some big hits, generate some offense. Certainly, we're not able to, and it's a good man. It's going to be a tough. I mean, they got Barros, but Sonny Gray, he's had a great season. He's going deep into games. Uh, what two seven nine ERA, one one five uh, WHIP, one hundred eighty three strikeouts, one hundred eighty four innings. I mean, this guy, uh, he's a ball player, so it's going to be tough. I think tough task uh, tonight for for the Jays or this afternoon. I guess three thirty, right when we're done. You know who else is a ball player? Royce Lewis. Yes. 
um, former number one overall pick in 2017. And I didn't know this. I guess he'd missed like the last couple of months and just shows up for the playoffs and goes yard on Gosman for in his, both of his first two at-bats. That was a tough way to get going for uh, for Gosman. He only lasted four, but did rebound quite well after those two bombs from uh, from uh, from Royce Lewis. Gave them all the runs that they needed to uh, to make. And by the way, I know they put in Hicks at the end, and he was throwing gas uh, as were. And, and I did like the way. I know I said I was very nervous about John Schneider's usage of the bullpen. Put some of his important guys into high leverage situations. Can't really complain about that. But my God, that Duran, the the uh, yes, the closer, he's the best on the Twins. He throws heat. Did they had a stat during the game? Hicks was number two in the league for average speed of fastball. Yeah, at like one hundred point eight or something like that. And then there was Duran, who averaged one hundred one point nine. Yes, and had a couple of pitches yesterday that were one hundred three, and then would throw a curveball. For a strike at 87, you cannot be playing from behind against the Twins. And a big start, a good start, getting some runs early, so crucial tonight for the Blue Jays. Yeah, and I'm you know reading the chat. I think it was Alex Howe. He's like, hey, the uh, what was it? The Twins got the big hit. The Blue Jays didn't, and that's the ball game. So for the Jays, I mean, when guys get on base in scoring position, you gotta you gotta send them home. You gotta send them home and. Uh, this afternoon, we'll see if uh, Ken and Mike, it was worth it for Ken and Mike. And Mike will join us uh, tomorrow to talk about their experience there. Yeah, no doubt. We'll obviously, we'll get ready for tomorrow's game um, and talk mostly Jets with Mike. But we'll also get into uh, a little bit of the uh, the playoff experience. And uh, hey, fingers crossed, we'll have a game to talk about tomorrow. If Berrios and the Blue Jays can get it done this afternoon and get this series to a third and deciding game. One thing I'll say is the atmosphere at Target Field yesterday for that game was phenomenal. I mean, yeah, there were a ton of, there was a bunch of Blue Jays fans. I don't want to say a ton, but for a midweek afternoon game for a team that had lost 18 straight playoff games, I was very impressed with the uh, atmosphere and the passion that the Twins fans had for their club last night. And obviously, they got a great start. They were into it the whole time when they finally broke that incredible streak that didn't even seem, even seem possible, to be honest. Yes, 18 straight uh, losses. Will they get their first series win in like <laughs> 20 years here against the Blue Jays? You wouldn't want to be be that team. So, uh, But hey, they're, they're a good squad. They've had a lot of good teams. It just hasn't broken the Twins' way, which seems crazy. So looking forward to uh, this afternoon. Pretty nice zinger from Yin Vivian in chat. Did Bo Bichette miss driver's ed? Stop sign. Um, listen, a Blue Jays game is just not complete without some sort of base running gaff for you. <laughs> I mean, that's a tough one. You're trying to make a play, maybe got a bit too excited and uh, gunned down at the plate. And, oh, here's Rocco Baldelli saying today about Carlos Correa's brilliant play to nail him at the plate in game one. It's a play I think we'll see forever in Twins history. That's what the Twins manager thinks about that one. Well, listen, for that organization and franchise, that was pretty big because, as I said, you lose 18 straight playoff games. That wears on the fans. We had Jesse Pierce on yesterday talking about it. So uh, Twins strike first. They end the streak, but the job isn't done. And this is a short series. Jay's got to win two games in a row. They did that probably, well, 30, 40 times throughout the regular season. So uh, they got to do it today. Barrios on the hill, 3.30 p.m. We'll uh, touch on the lines when uh, we finish up the show shortly before first pitch down at Target Field. But um, Reem Bomber's back at practice today. Getting ready for BC. We will talk about that with Derek Taylor later on. Of course, the big news yesterday was Janarian Grant coming off the sixth game, returning to practice with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, and the expectation is that he'll be a player for Mike O'Shea in that huge tilt on, on Friday night. We're going to talk about that and more with Derek Taylor, voice of the Bombers, later on in the program. But let's get to practice today because uh, Jets off yesterday, back at practice one more time before one more preseason game. And, you know, with these lines, Reem, we're basically getting a chance to see 
exactly the way Rick Bonus is planning for his team to look a week from today when the Jets begin the NHL regular season against the Calgary Flames in Cowtown. Yeah, here are the lines, and we did have one roster move today. Jeffrey VL getting sent from the Jets, uh, put on waivers, assigned to the Moose. Uh, I haven't seen the waiver report from Elliot as it comes out this, right when we start the show. But here are the lines. And then, you know, finally, everyone's everyone's healthy. Has uh, Velarde, Shafley, Connor Barron recovered from the flu. Schmidt and Chisholm practicing in a regular jersey after being out briefly with a regular or sort of lower body. And Ehlers, we've talked about neck spasm since 17 minutes into training camp. Uh, he's also practicing regular jersey. So we got Connor Shafley, Velarde. Ehlers, Perfetti, Nita Ryder, Ifal, Lowry, Appleton, Baron, Kupari, Nemesnikov, and then the fourth or fifth forward line, uh, Axel Janssen, Fialbi with Gustafson and Ford. And then on defense, Morrissey, DeMello. And we've talked a lot about this guy, Billy Hainel, paired with Brandon Dillon on the second pair. Whoa! Yeah, whoa. Billy's in the lineup. Yeah, do we have to fire off the goal horn for this one? <laughs> we've been putting out, check the video on our. You and Billick went on for 20 minutes yesterday talking about, are they going to give him a shot? He's earned it while he's playing with Brandon Dillon, who he had played with earlier in the preseason as a second pair. And then you got the Hermantown third pair, Sandberg, Pionk. And then I got Stanley Schmidt as the fourth pair and Declan Chisholm as rotating through. So those are the practice lines. And we'll have to wait and see. Ehlers, you know, they kind of said doubtful for preseason. Seems like if Ehlers wakes up tomorrow, feels good, and says, I want to play, uh, he'll be in the lineup. He was in a regular jersey. I mean, that's all, that's all we know. Yeah, um, listen, the fact that it wasn't non-contact is good. Skating with his line, great. Um, we'll hear from Bones on Ehlers in uh, in just a minute. Um, I, I think we shouldn't be surprised. Rick Bonus said that he was going to have the opportunity to play in these last two games and, you know, try and show that he belongs. I think most observers um, would agree that he has done that. Um, tomorrow, I would imagine, will be closer to a full NHL lineup, certainly the closest the Jets have had. And I imagine Ottawa will look pretty close to um, you know what they're expecting to start the season with. So it'll be another great opportunity for Billy to show what he can do. I do wonder, and we'll get into this with Marat a little bit later on, Reem, um, you know, if Billy goes out and has another strong game and makes the decision for them, I'm staying and I'm playing. I would imagine that the opening night lineup looks very similar to what we're seeing tonight if he's able to do that. But, I mean, there's nine defensemen right now at the club. The max they could have, barring somebody being put on IR, would be eight. Um I guess there's been lots of talk about Logan Stanley. Obviously, Kyle, that doesn't even include Kyle Capabianco, who's injured right now. And obviously, Nate Schmidt, with his big contract, um, you know, I would imagine is going to be on the team, even if he wasn't in the lineup for uh, for uh, the uh, the first time. Like, I can't imagine waving him. I know some people have suggested that and sending him to the moose. I think they, I think they want Schmidt on the team for a number of reasons, but I think they want to get Billy Hanel in and, uh, and be playing. But where do you think this leaves Declan Chisholm? I mean, a lot of us thought that he actually was ahead of Billy on the pecking order for not just because of waiver reasons coming into this training camp. Um, he's in a pretty precarious position right now. And again, I know the team would be absolutely low to lose him on waivers. But I do wonder about his situation now as essentially looking like this if he's rotating in as the ninth defenseman on the pecking order as the Jets get ready to make their cuts. Yeah, we came into this training camp being like, look, Billy Hainala, you know, he can play great, but he's got a two-way deal and it's going to keep him uh, starting the season with the Moose. But his play, um, you know, has really, I think, turned heads and he's, you know, he's been one of the top performers in every game that he's played. I mean, it would be almost silly to send him down at this point, even if it's the easiest option. So, uh, I mean, you look at the way the lines are today, uh, he's... This could be a day one lineup, and you have to think he has a uh, leapfrog uh, Chisholm and uh, Stanley for sure. And you know, you have to send down one. You know, let's assume Cabo Bianco starts injured. Well, you're sending down one D, and you're keeping two extra D. And uh, Gustafson 
uh, we would say he's the you know front runner here for the thirteenth forward. I don't know. Do you send down Logan Stanley and say, "Hey, I liked how you said it yesterday in the conversation, Bill." Like, like one of the many uh, recent first round picks to get sent, you know, send on waivers recently. He's requested a trade, and it doesn't seem to be working out for go out here uh, for him. He's what making a million dollars. Maybe he's the one that you send down and you keep Chisholm, and he's the extra guy. I mean, it would be tough. I mean, tough break for either of them because you're not going to be getting regular playing time here with the Jets. I would think uh, Schmidt would be ahead, mm-hmm. but uh, maybe you send down send down Stanley, and, or do you send down Chisholm and and pray that uh, you know he doesn't get mm-hmm. picked up this time? Yeah, I, I mean, like I, I I I have no idea where what sort of a stomach they have for risking either of those players and how they would feel um you know if you kind of you know pumped the true serum into the gm and said you're you got, you're gonna lose one of these two guys who are you more comfortable with is it logan stanley is it declan chisholm i don't know what the answer would be i think if you pulled most of the fans and certainly the people in the chat they would say you can't lose chisholm he's the guy that we haven't seen at the nhl level yet um, Logan Stanley played for the last number of years, did only get in 19 games last year. But I, I think we pretty much know what Logan Stanley is right now, whereas there's a lot of upside and I think a pretty high ceiling for Declan Chisholm coming up. So uh, well, I don't know what where, where you're on, at on that. Yeah, well, I was going to say it's also possible. You know, they just want to get another look at Billy and he's actually just a placeholder. For Nate Schmidt and Nate Schmidt starts when they do take the easy option. I mean, we're kind of jumping, we're we're jumping to a lot of conclusions here just based on, you know, practice practice lines, Hustler. So, uh, but it, I think he's got to get a you got to give him a look at this point. He's done what he can in the AHL. He's played really well in the preseason. Certainly earned, you know, some games here. And if it doesn't work, then you can send him down, and he is waivers. Exempt, but they're probably gonna have to make a tough decision either way. When you know, even when Capo comes back, and you know, maybe you go, mm-hmm. maybe you think more likely Chisholm isn't gonna get. No one's gonna want to take a chance on it on him because I think it is hard to bring in a contract of a guy who is uh, unproven. You have to keep him at the NHL level, and Stanley has played more NHL games. I, I, so. I guess there's the possibility that if Declan you know, was picked up. If they put him on waivers, he was picked up by another team. I, I mean, it could end up in two ways. He could turn into Johnny Kovacevic, where the guy just gets a spot, plays regularly, and you never see him again. Or they go in, they play a little bit, and then they end up being back on waivers, and the team can reclaim him. Yeah, and one thing about waivers, you know, we talked so much about former first-round picks, and yes, Elliot, Elliot Friedman tweeting that everyone who was on waivers yesterday cleared... Uh, one of those players was Jacob Bernard Docker, who stuck out from Anaheim. He was a first round pick in twenty twenty or sorry, twenty eighteen. It was Ottawa, wasn't it? Yeah, from Ottawa. What did I say? Anaheim? Anaheim. Yeah, yeah that sorry, I got confused because An- they picked up the other first round pick. But um from Ottawa, first round pick in twenty eighteen, twenty six overall. Um, you know, last year it has he had thirty five points in forty one AHL games. He played nineteen AHL games. He cleared waivers, so uh, showed it to Julian and Chad saying, hey, if this guy's clearing waivers, you'd have to think that two of the Jets, whoever you know, whoever it is, Stanley or Chisholm, are, are going to clear as well. But sometimes it's about timing, a timing game also. Maybe there were teams were comfortable with what they had and, and didn't want to add another body. So uh, that's kind no, of... Well, because when, when was Johnny last year? It was near the end of training camp, wasn't it? It was like yeah, right yeah. before. Well, and, and listen, this is the time when teams are trying to squeeze guys you know, through. And, and every team's got tough decisions. And uh, who was it? Spency. <laughs> what up, Spency? Uh, makes a great point. Every team is sending a pile of guys down on waivers. Nobody has the room for more guys. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of teams that will look at the guys they have and the guys that are on waivers and say, you know what? This guy's better than the guy we've got. Well, Axel last year was a perfect example. He was a late cut by the uh, Capitals, I believe. And the Jets thought this guy can help our penalty killing. He's better than the guys we've got right now. We want him. And vice versa, losing um, Johnny Kovacevic. You know, he was ninth or 10th on the depth chart. Wasn't going to be playing here. Sent him to the Moose. Montreal liked him, got him, and now he's a regular. 
for the Montreal Canadiens. So there certainly is a lot of intrigue around all of this heading into final cuts. And again, as Michael mentioned, Jeffrey VL put on waivers today with the purpose of being assigned to the Manitoba Moose. Um, Wyshynski's coming up, but let's hear from Rick Bonus. Um, Bones spoke after practice today, and uh, it was a longer, more spirited one as the team gets ready for their final preseason game. And here's what the coach had to say about uh, getting the, the team together and having a legit full practice. The good news is that the guys that were feeling poorly the last couple of days, even though they weren't 100% out there today, they, they worked their way through it, and they all felt better at the end of practice. So getting the lungs back and getting some energy back was huge. I think they felt better after practice than before, so I guess that would be the positive. So knock on wood, you're over the hump of that, Tim? Knock on wood, man. But you know I'm not superstitious, so that means nothing to me. <laughs> Just from that perspective, how good was it to finally have the 12 forwards and the six defensemen that you were envisioning, you know, to work on things like a proper power play, like a proper well, that, yeah, that's the first day we've really been able to do it now. How clearly, we're not sure on Nick's status for tomorrow night. Um, but I would still doubt he won't play. But regardless of that, we need to practice those with those with those guys and and get some familiarity with all the units. Penalty killing as well. Now we still have a lot of bodies here, um, but at least we, we're getting a look of how we want it to look when we start the season. All right, there's Rick Bonus and. I- that was a very confusing yes. quote on Ehlers. <laughs> what did he say? I doubt he won't play. Yeah, I which d- is a double negative, which would mean that he probably will play. But I don't think that was. Yeah, I think he meant to say I doubt <laughs> was a, he will play. What he said, play. what he meant, moment. Uh, yeah, Rebus. I think he. I think he meant I doubt he will play. You know, you do these media scrums. You know, think one thing and another thing comes out we know it all too well here hustler <laughs> yeah we do well you know why don't you play clip three just uh, we'll get right to Ehlers right now uh because bones did um expand a little bit on uh, Nikolai Ehlers situation as we're uh, getting ready for that pre uh preseason finale Rick considering that Nikolai had full participation in practice was doing power play as well would it be safe to say that perhaps tomorrow he might be game time decision then well I yeah, in the perfect world, yeah. But we'll have to see how what he feels like in the morning. If it's not 100%, then he, he's going to have to make that call, not us. And he, he knows what he feels. We don't. Uh, he knows where he is, and we, we don't want a setback. But I I'm, I'm, would love for him to show up and say, Bones, I want to play. I'd love to hear that. Also, it's not, not a medical decision necessarily. Well, it's, him, it's his, you know, he, again, it's how he feels. He's the only one that knows how he feels. And if he's not 100%, then he won't play. But he, he again, he knows his body and he knows where the aches are and uh, how he has to feel to play. Right, there you have it. So uh, certainly cleared by the team to play, uh, but the rather strange preseason saga of Nikolai Ehlers continues. And uh, hey, hopefully we'll see him tomorrow night playing for the first time with Cole Perfetti and Nino Niederreiter in the preseason as the Jets take on the Ottawa Senators. We're going to get ready for NHL season coming up in just a second with Greg Wyshynski. Let me give a big shout-out to our friends at Modern Man Barbershop, now with eight locations in Winnipeg, including the newest locations on either Pembina Highway or Plessy Road. Modern Man Barbershops offer a variety of grooming services, including haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. Book your look via modernmanbarber.com. I did. Thank God I need one big time. I'll see them later on today. Now give them a follow on Instagram as well at Modern Man Barber Shops. Don't forget, pool season's done. But if you're planning for a pool next year, you can take the plunge with Aquatech. What you might not know is that whole home renos start with Aquatech, with thousands of renovations as their foundation. Aquatech can upgrade any space in your home. If you're ready to enhance your kitchen, bathroom, or even add a man cave to your home, visit aqua-tech.ca. To learn more about their whole home renovations, including financing options. It's just before we bring in Wish, a big shout out to our friends at Manitoba Battery. Great sponsors of ours. The summer's done. We had a great time running around and having Manitoba Battery power the boats and campers and lawn tractors. Now it's time to get ready for hockey season and winter. And Manitoba Battery has the best prices on car and truck batteries in town. You'll be shopping local. And the best part about it is... You don't even need to go down there. They'll bring it to you. Free delivery with every order over 60 bucks. It's that easy. Get the best prices in town at manitobabattery.com. Order online. 
Give them a call at 783-8787. Donnie and his staff will bring it to you, or you can always pop by and see them at 1026 Logan Avenue. All right, let's get ready for Puck Drop next week with ESPN's Greg Wyshynski. Wish, what's going on? How are you? I'm good. Can't complain. Uh, Nick Ehlers uh, out of the lineup again for a change, huh? Never never heard that. Never experienced that before as a hockey dude, fan. Dude, dude, it has been a weird, weird... Um, and, and I mean, I guess I mean, if you're looking on the bright side, glad this is happening a early preseason as opposed to during the year. But I mean, it was 17 minutes of the first practice and then had some neck spasms and his base hasn't been able to play in a game yet. And as we just heard from Rick Bonus. Um, they're hoping he'll come in tomorrow and say he's good to go and ready to play. I'm sure he's feeling some pressure to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like for that line, when it comes to the Winnipeg Jets, I mean, Cole Perfetti has had some injury issues the last couple of years. Nikolai Ehlers as well. I mean, both high-end players when they're in the lineup. But with the loss of Pierre-Luc Dubois, there is a lot riding on that second line. And it is a little unfortunate. We haven't been able to see them together at any point in the preseason so far. Yeah, and that's really been the key for them for the last couple of seasons is the health of of the of the secondary and supporting players behind the top line guys. And it just it's just a bummer. Because you're right. I mean, I think we're all really curious to see what the Jets end up looking like this year after, you know, the Dubois trade and you know, the, the the weirdness of they're going to blow up the team. No, they're not really. Everybody's still here uh, kind of thing that went on. And so I, I'm, I'm really curious about what the Jets look like because I do think the Central, once you get beyond the, uh, the big two in the Central, uh, I think there is a little bit more flux behind them. Well, and that's why, Greg, and obviously you're paying more attention to the entire league and we're really focused on this one team. But I look around the league. I think the Jets might be the most interesting and fascinating team in the league going into this season. I mean, the range of outcomes for Winnipeg going into game number one, I think could be as high as five, six, seven, and could be as low as like 30, depending <laughs> on what happens. And to be honest, I mean, the first 25 to 30 games are going to be so important because as we've talked about before, there are massive decisions for this organization to make as to, you know, in a lot of ways, they're just kind of idling at this crossroads. Is Hellebuck staying? Is he going? What's the future of Mark Shifley? And I think where this team is in the standings, you know, as we get into the holiday season past U.S. Thanksgiving, in a lot of ways is going to direct Kevin Day off in the moves that may or may not be coming in the second half of the year. For sure. And and I think that if if anything, they've been under discussed, which again probably isn't anything new for Jets fans when you look at the national perspective on the team. But um it's pretty remarkable that that Hellebuck's still there. I mean, given the number of teams that could use a top flight elite goaltender, uh the fact that he is still there surprised me a little bit even a little bit more than, than Shifley still being there. And then, you know, the Dubois trade. Is also sort of something that people have, have not really paid attention to. One, I don't, I don't think they, there's enough talk, people talking about the LA Kings for, for one thing. I think the Kings are incredibly stacked on paper, and uh, it's curious that they're not being elevated more as a contender in the West. Maybe that has to do with the goaltending, I'm not sure. But two, the fact that the Jets didn't like sell off Dubois for parts. Like They got three NHL players back of varying degrees of success, and you would think that there'd be more attention paid to the fact that this lineup was, uh, if not bolstered, at least kind of like can sustain itself based on what came back the other way. Um, what are your thoughts on the Jets overall? I mean, I, I, like people ask me all the time and I say, I have no idea. Um, Dusty and I uh, just did the lock shop and we were going over props for the entire season and the Jets total is a 94 and a half, which I think is two off of where they were last year. They were a playoff team. You mentioned the Central being certainly weaker than it's been historically been over the last five, six, seven years. Um, do you have a lean one way or the other on what we're going to see from Winnipeg and how this turns out? I'm taking the under, unfortunately, for the Jets fans. Uh, I, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the injuries situation is always cropping up. I, I would be surprised if Josh Morrissey met his point total from last year again. The things that are being discussed as far as like what the future of this group looks like, it all adds up to being, I think, it ultimately perhaps a frustrating year for them. The Central is funny, though. I mean, like, like I said, once you get past Colorado and Dallas, you have a Minnesota team that feels like it's in purgatory, like they're just penciled them in for 100 points and then losing the first round every year. 
Uh, and then you have this Nashville team that I find to be very interesting because on paper, they're not really deep and they're not really offensively talented. But they do have a guy in Andrew Burnett that's found a way to get a lot of offense out of the groups that he's coached as the head coach of the Florida Panthers and as the associate coach with the New Jersey Devils last year. And then they also have a guy that, you know, puck for puck is one of the few goalies that can match what Hellebuck gives you in UC Soros. So I'm a little bit higher on the Predators than I am the Jets. And the one I'm really watching, the one that could be a big surprise is Arizona. Uh, I bought into the mullet magic last year. Um, they played extraordinarily well in that weird little arena, but they've added talent to that lineup, be it Jason Zucker, um, be it Logan Cooley, the the rookie who I think is going to give Bedard a run for his money for the Calder. Uh, they're they're going to be sneaky good, and, and they've got good goaltending too, and, and I'm a little bit uh, curious what their ceiling looks like in that division. You know, um, one team that we didn't touch on is the Blues. And the Blues were a very disappointing team last year. They made some significant moves in the offseason. Um, I don't think this is ever planned to be a long, painful rebuild, if you will. Um, where are you at on St. Louis? I mean, is that a playoff team, or are they a little ways away from getting it together? They're not a playoff team, and they're they're a team that probably needs to blow it up before they get back to where they want to be, too. I mean, like, their defense, to me, is a defense in name only. There's a lot of guys on there that we know the names, but their effectiveness has dipped in in, in the recent years. Um, I, I think you're, you're also looking at a situation where they're a one-line team. I mean, the line they can throw, roll out there with Bushnevich and, and Kairu and Thomas is great, uh, but there's not a whole heck of a lot behind them anymore with some of the attrition they've had in that lineup. And I've never been a Jordan Bennington fan. <laughs> like, uh, uh, okay, let me rephrase that. Everybody was a Jordan Bennington fan for one year, like when he was doing his <laughs> not thing around here. Rookie. Yeah, well, no. <laughs> okay, you gotta you gotta respect the game at least, right? And I mean, he, he walked into Boston and won a game seven, and and you have to respect that. But I mean, it's ever since that year when they won the cup, his save percentage has dropped every season since then, and he's the classic goaltender where the analytics tell you for the most part that he's been poor. And then you have people that are swearing by the eye test in St. Louis and always just come back at you so harshly on social media if you dare criticize Jordan Bennington. I'm not a Bennington guy. They've downgraded their backup. And I think the Blues are going to be right above the Blackhawks in the Central as far as where they place in, that, in the standings. Well, the other thing about um, Bennington, too, is that he so easily com gets completely unhinged. And uh, I know that was something that, you know, Craig Berube wasn't too pleased with last year. I mean, for a guy that's supposed to be the veteran and your backbone of the club, you can't be flying off the handle all the time. I mean, if your goalie's not poised, what does that do to the rest of your team? Yeah, and, 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 and there were times when they looked at it as him firing up the team, and there were times when they looked at it as him being petulant. I mean, the bottom line for the Blues is that there's a better chance their goalie is going to get a fighting major this year than them making the playoffs. <laughs> listen i definitely uh, definitely here for that um listen uh, everyone for good reason is talking about the edmonton oilers they are now looking at cool bet right here the betting favorite to win the cup slightly ahead of the colorado avalanche um you've got some other great teams up there in vegas and um certainly the leafs but um i know you're high on edmonton is this the year is this the year first of all that the cup returns to canada and will that spot be in northern Alberta and Connor McDavid getting to the top of the mountain? Well, obviously the odds moved because I, I published my predictions this morning and I, I said the Oilers would win the cup. I said Line the same mover. thing last year, of course. Um, I texted Ken Holland uh, to let him know I was picking them again. And his response was just, oh boy. That's the only <laughs> thing he said. Uh, like, here's the thing about Edmonton. I, I, I am picking them again to win because I think I was a year early. Uh, my take on them last year was that when you get two generational talents on the same team, they find a way to win at some point, like whether it's Mario and Yager, or Gretzky and Messier, or, or Malkin and Crosby. And so that'll happen for Connor and Leon. And what I screwed up on was not realizing that they hadn't reached that point that like McKinnon reached with Colorado, where losing was no longer an option, where they were just so ticked off about how things have gone in the playoffs for them, that they simply couldn't stomach losing. I think they're there now. I talked to both Dreisaitl and McDavid during the players' tour in Vegas. I, we, had, we had good conversations about 
what happened last year and their feelings about it. And and I get the sense that they've reached that point now where, you know, they're just going to, it's going to be that year where they just do everything humanly possible to drag this team through the West and then get to the cup final. To answer your other question, I do, I do think it's the year that the cup goes back to Canada for the first time since 1993. It's been a great, great run for the U S because I have them beating the Leafs in the final. I love two things about that. I love the fact that, Fans in Calgary are going to have to figure out whether the route for the Oilers. Oh my God! For the Leafs, <laughs> <laughs> and I also love the fact that, like, the one thing that we can all agree on is we all love Connor McDavid. Like, McDavid is a remarkably, you know, a, just ethereal player. Like, he, he's going to be one of these guys that we tell our grandkids about. <clears throat> um, but if he becomes the guy that prevents the Leafs from winning their first cups in '67. I think that adds a whole other layer to him. I think there'll be a certain villain status supplied to him from the people of Ontario that isn't there now, and that's kind of exciting to think about. And at the same point, a uh, hero status on neutrals and hockey fans from all the other Canadian markets. It's speaking of the Canadian markets, just stay out west for a minute. Calgary um, has had big changes in the front office, um, and Vancouver, I-, I never know where Vancouver's at. They seem to be kind of in that mushy middle, a place where the Jets sort of currently reside, although they've been able to get to the playoffs. Um, do you think either of those teams will be uh, in the final 16? I, I do think the Canucks will. Um, I have them making the playoffs this year. I like I like Rick Tockett getting a full preseason behind the bench to kind of put his stamp on the team in the way he couldn't last year. A healthy Thatcher Demko, we've seen that two years ago where he carried that team on his back to the point where people started to talk about him as a potential Vezina candidate. Um, you know, great individual players and, and Patterson and uh, Miller and Besser and, and players like that. And Quinn Hughes was almost a point per game defenseman for them last year. I wonder if it all adds up to being a playoff team. I'm wagering that it does. And and the, the one thing I really like about what they did in the off season is they identified their blue line as being insufficient and then made it better. You know, they, they picked up uh, Ian Cole um, they picked up Carson Soucy from the uh, Seattle Kraken, made a couple other moves. It, it seems like they've addressed the problem sufficiently enough where I think they're a little bit better than Calgary, and I think they'll be a little bit better than Seattle because I think Seattle is going to regress based on their goaltending and based on the, fa- the fact that I don't think they're going to lead the league in, in shooting percentage again. Uh, Greg, over to the East, speaking of playoff teams, um... The Ottawa Senators have kind of had this slow ascent. They've done a great job at signing their young players. Now it's time to win and actually do something. And uh, no one's been waiting longer than the fans in Buffalo. Um, And they finally do have an exciting team. I think they've got a real bright future. Can either of those teams, and well, we'll include the Pittsburgh Penguins too, because they missed the playoffs, a very different situation for their club. All three of those teams are pushing to get into that top eight and be there when the Stanley Cup playoff starts. Um, will Pittsburgh return, or can Ottawa or Buffalo bounce one of those other teams out and actually finally get back to the playoff tournament? Yeah, Pittsburgh's an easy call. I think I think they'll be in. I mean, I, I visited their camp. Um, I like the mix there right now. I think while he's not everybody's favorite, Tristan Jari is a good regular season goalie and can get the job done there. Um, and again, the luxury of being able to play a Norris caliber defenseman every single time Malkin or Crosby are on the ice, which is what they can do now with Eric Carlson and Chris Letang is, is pretty remarkable. So I think they're a playoff team. Um, I have the, the senators ascending. I'm a little nervous about the health of Josh Norris right now, but I think maybe hopefully he'll be okay. Their goaltending, I think is going to be really good. Uh, Corpus Allo, um, I know people run hot and cold on him. I think he's going to be better than, than average for them. Um, you know, their lineup is pretty loaded. And, and like you said, they, they added, uh, they, they have all their young players under contract. They added Vladimir Tarasenko in the off season. Um, I think they're going to be good. Uh, and I think they're going to be better than Buffalo who hasn't convinced me yet that they can defend well enough to earn a playoff spot. Uh, but who they replace is the question. And the team I think they're going to replace is the Tampa Bay lightning. I, I, I am very, uh, skeptical about the lightning this year. I was before Vasilevsky's injury. I'm even more so now. Um, at some point, teams become top heavy and they lose enough of their supporting cast where it comes back to bite them. And I think I think Tampa's there. I mean, you look at the team that won the cup 
and how many names from that team are no longer there, but be it Palat, Kalorn, Gord, Blake Coleman, Ryan McDonough, I mean, Ross Colton. Like, it, at some point, it catches up with you, and you look at the supporting cast that's there now. I think this is the year where it might catch up with them. And I think it's one of the reasons why Julianne Breezebois, their GM, taking that wait and see approach with Steven Stamkos's contract because he knows there's some really heavy lifting to be done with that lineup um, because it's not necessarily cup caliber right now. Let me ask you about two other teams in the East that were both in the playoffs last year, but sort of got there in different ways. The New Jersey Devils, who I know you were uh, very keen on, had just an unbelievable season. I mean, breakout in so many different ways. Uh, and then there's the Florida Panthers, who won the President's Trophy the year before and honestly had to get incredibly fortunate in the final week of the season just to be in the playoffs and then went all the way to the final. Um, is New Jersey still ascending? And is Florida more a team that is like right around the eighth spot? Are they better than that? Or might they be there with their the other Florida team uh, observing when we get to the postseason? The Devils, we haven't even seen their ceiling yet. Yet, I think they're going to win the Metro. Um, I, I think they're going to put up a ton of goals this year. Um, I am a little bit concerned about them buying into their own hype, um, which can happen to a young team after the season they had last year. Uh, and I also think that people are, are underestimating uh, how much the losses on their back end are going to affect them with Damon Severson now in Columbus and Ryan Graves in Pittsburgh. Like Those are two good veteran guys that certainly were a stabilizing force and, you know, you need that when you have guys like Luke Hughes trying to still learn how to play defense in this league as a rookie. But they're going to be fine. I think, I think they're going to win the division. As far as, um, as, far as uh, uh, the Panthers go, um, that's what I struggled with. Like, I thought maybe they would be the one that I look at and say they're going to fall out. And maybe they do. Maybe it's like the two Florida teams fall out and we're talking about Buffalo and Ottawa in the playoffs. It's possible. But they just scored so many goals last year, um, you know, and, and that part of their lineup, I think is still going to be okay. They're missing Ekblad and they're missing Montour off the start of the season, but everybody else up front is healthy. Um, they just need to get goaltending from Bobrovsky mm -hmm. and regular season. Bob is obviously a different animal than playoff Bob. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, the Panthers have, have turned the corner as a franchise and are, are just so good and deep that I think they're going to be a playoff team. Wish I was on with Dustin Nielsen. We were doing the lock shop last hour, and uh, we were going over a whole bunch of props, and we got talking about Connor Bedard. Um, his goal prop is 31 and a half. His points oh. is about 72 and a half. Um, I mean, I look at that and just, I mean, I don't know how he doesn't get that. I have injuries. That's how he doesn't. But uh, where are you at Bedard? How, how high are your expectations for his rookie season? Uh, and what does that do for the Blackhawks? Over 31 is free money. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I mean, I think, I'm with kid, you. I think that kid tops out at, at around 35 uh, for the season. He's also like, I, I know, like, you look at him and you're like, hey, he's a child, but he's he's pretty like built. Like, he's pretty like stout as a as a player as far as his body development goes. So I think while we have visions of you know Jack Hughes getting knocked around this league like a pinball as a rookie, like I think Connor Bedard might be more battle ready than than some of the other rookies that have come up of his caliber. Um, as far as it leads to the Blackhawks, I again, I, I just think that roster is terrible. Um, their goaltending is the worst in the league based on the uh, goalie tandem rankings we just did on ESPN. Um, and they should be bad. Like the, the, the point should not be to have Connor Bedard elevate this team to contention now. The point should be for them to suck for the next two years and then you can build a really good team around them. You know, find the, the the cane for his taves, if you will, uh, to look back at other Blackhawks teams. So hopefully they're not good, um, but he'll be really good. This is like the comparison I made is, you know, and this is how old I am, is like um, I covered uh, Ovechkin in his rookie year. The 0506 Capitals were a team that tore it down to the foundations in order to be able to draft the guy. The Blackhawks did the same thing. I mean, there's, there's not really like too many degrees of separation between – you know, Dinus Zubris at 28 joining the Capitals to be with Ovechkin and like Taylor Hall being on the Blackhawks. Like they're both teams that have some familiar names, a bunch of journeymen, some younger guys. And then like in the Blackhawks case, inexplicably Seth Jones is still there. So it's like, it's uh, other than that though, I just think that they, they are going to be bad and they should be bad. Uh, Greg, is there uh, a player or two that might not be a household name 
to casual fans or the average fan that you think might be a breakout player this year? Uh, is there a couple guys to watch that um, we should kind of make a note? Remember when Wish told us before the season that this guy was going to be awesome this year? Well, Evan Bouchard's won with the Oilers. And, and, and I mean, obviously, statistically, he's he's been great. Um, and you can say maybe he's broken out, but he's not a household name yet. I think he will be this year. The numbers he put up after they traded Tyson Berry to Nashville uh, were pretty remarkable. And they have him paired with, uh, Mat- with Matias Ekholm. That's a great pairing. It worked out really well last year. And I think he's going to have a superlative offensive season for that team. And the other guy also in the West I'm looking at, Wyatt Johnston from the Dallas Stars, who made a lot of waves in the playoff run for them to the co- to the uh, conference final. I think he's a really good offensive player. And, and I know it's a, it's a stacked lineup. He's going to have to earn his ice time. But he's a guy that I think, given the right opportunity, could re- be, really be a, a, an outstanding offensive player for them this year. Who do you think is going to be the most disappointing team in the NHL this season? Well, I mean, I guess the... The lightning would be my de facto yeah. pick because I have him missing. But um, you know, I I I don't know. Like I I have a, a lot of the teams that you'd expect to be in the playoffs in the playoffs, and I don't know what the expectations are for a a Seattle or a Calgary. Um, you know, like uh, the the Islanders, I, I think miss, but you know they were barely a playoff team last year. So I guess I'd have to say the lightning just based on pedigree. Yeah, um, you know. We were uh, one of the other things we were looking at at this season was the uh, you know the point totals, and I couldn't help but notice they had the Ducks at sixty six and a half and the Sharks at sixty six and a half. How uh, how fierce will the race for the bottom be this year, and uh, who wins? <laughs> the Sharks better win. The Sharks are in a position where they they're a team that needs a North Star, right? Like they they need to find a way to focus in on the future. They don't have a player in their system that's really like the next guy. They're in that purgatory of having players like Logan Couture and Thomas Hurdle still on the roster despite clearly wanting to be in a a rebuild now. Um, I I hope they're under 67 and a half because I hope that they get a top two pick and grab one of those kids next year and and they can kind of like start cycling back because I think it's a very, very good market for the NHL. And right now it is in uh, disrepair because of how bad the Sharks are. How, um, I mean, I'll be honest, we haven't talked at all, I mean, about the draft since we left Nashville. But uh, what's the prognosis for the draft? Like, how how valuable will that number one pick be? Um, is it closer to a Bedard or closer to a Slavskovsky next year? <laughs> Probably somewhere in between. Um, you know, uh, I think the top, the top two picks are, are are pretty more like not franchise level Bedard types, but guys that certainly you can build around. Maybe a step down from that. Um, but I'm not. I haven't heard what the overall depth of next year's draft was. I mean, obviously with this past one, the only thing we heard time and time again was how good and deep the draft was and how everybody was keeping the, their first overall picks. Um, I think at last glance that was also the situation for next year's draft. So. We'll see what comes of it. But again, like there are definitely teams like the Sharks, Flyers are another one that we, we, we would behoove them to be as bad as possible this year. <laughs> Good point. Uh, just on the way out, does your guy Jack Hughes hit triple digits in points this year? I think so. Um, he would become the first devil to ever hit 100 points if that were to happen. Um, my colleague Arda O'Cal on our podcast, The Drop, which by the way, you can find on the ESP, NHL and ESPN feeds on uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, he thinks Jack for the heart, um, which I think is bold, but not implausible if the Devils end up winning the Metro division and he ends up going over 100 points. Um, he's a special player, and uh, and there's nothing to make me believe that they're not going to be a great offensive team again this year. Well, listen, I mean, it's a ballsy pick. I mean, any anybody other than McDavid's a ballsy pick, but considering <laughs> he's even money for the heart trophy, if you like somebody else... You're gonna get a great Connor. Number. Connor's even money for the heart. Even money. Yeah, uh, I see. That the thing about him is that, like, while there's always the chance he's gonna pop off and be even better than he was last year, there's a another chance that he's gonna like decrease his point total. And if that happens, it's gonna open the door for someone else, probably. So it, it, exactly, and not, I I don't mind the thought of uh, of Hughes as far as that next group of guys that could potentially challenge. Team success is very important. That was a 52 win team last year. And certainly if they can even take another step, he will get a lot of look. I'm glad you mentioned the drop. 
Um, great stuff with our uh, good friend Arda as well. Fill people in on what you and the ESPN team have coming up as we get closer and closer to puck drop across the league next week, Wish. Sure. sure. Next edition of The Drop is tomorrow. We have a great interview with Corey Schneider, who just retired from the league about uh, not only his career, but also the goaltending position. We get real hockey nerd with him on that. And then, um, you know, for me, I just published our goalie tandem rankings. I just published the season prediction column. That is 12,000 words of content churned out in the last two days. So I hope some people go to ESPN and check out the fruits of my labor because uh, it was a lot of labor and a lot of late nights and maybe more than a few uh, fingers of, of whiskey. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good stuff. Hey, just on the way out, I was just finished with Nielsen. He said when you were on Edmonton Sports Talk this morning, um, there was a revelation about the way hamburgers are cooked in, uh, yeah. in, in Canada. I had no idea. Yeah, uh, Dusty told me that you guys, wherever you go, there's no conversation about how you want your burger cooked. It's just well done, which is insane to me because, like, if you go to a place that's, you know, a, a decent burger restaurant that has, like, let's say a steakhouse, the burger on the menu in, in, the, in the States, you say what, how you want it cooked. I get mine medium rare. So the juices kind of flow out of it when you bite into it. And just the idea of that not being an option anywhere in Canada. I, 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 again, I've been doing this gig for like 15 years. I've been on podcasts with everybody from Jeff Merrick to everybody, you know, and, and talking about Canada incessantly. And like at no point did the burger <laughs> cooking thing come up and I was astounded by it. Yeah, it is. Uh, and it's one of those same things where Canadians go somewhere and they're like, how do you want your burger done? I'm like, well, what do you mean? Um, yeah. <laughs> you just wouldn't even, wouldn't even like, I want it cooked. And then, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really funny, but no, I've never been a well done burger guy. When I was a kid, my dad would try to make burgers for me and I would say medium rare. And then I, uh, uh, you know, essentially he'd give me a commemorative puck on a bun and then he'll be like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, ca- I didn't catch it in time. I'm like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> you know, like, so I, 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 I don't like them well done. Bad childhood memories of bad, bad chefing by my dad. But uh, yeah, it's a luxury. If you like, again, I encourage all Canadians to at least order a burger here in the States once so you can get a sense of, of what you're dealing with. But uh, I was shocked by that. <laughs> Wish you're the best, buddy. Thanks for doing this and enjoy opening week in the NHL. Appreciate your time. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Good stuff. At Wyshynski, you know where to find them. Greg Wyshynski, and you can check out uh, all their content over at ESPN. All right, looking forward to having Marat join us uh, very quickly. We'll get to uh, the big questions and the great piece he's got in The Athletic, as well as what we heard today from a practice heading into the preseason finale. Before we do that, though, got to thank our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market. If you're looking for great prices on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries, pop on down to one of six Vita Health Fresh Market stores or online at myvita.ca including Winnipeg's largest selection of local products and local delivery available same day if you order by 11. And right now, get a free gift when you place an order of $100 or more at myvita.ca. A proud family owned and operated since 1936. And of course, Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives. Six Winnipeg locations and online at myvita.ca. Um, you all know that Wallace and Wallace have been the fencing specialists in Winnipeg for 1946. You've seen their fences and trucks all over the city. What you might not know is they're also the leader in overhead doors as the exclusive clopay dealer in Manitoba. Your overhead garage door had lots of ups and downs this season, getting you everywhere you were going, but it's about to work a lot harder because winter puts much more stress on your garage door. The right time to prevent downtime this winter is now. Call Wallace & Wallace to book your inspection and maintenance service call today for residential and commercial overhead door sales and service. There's only one name or two you need to know, and that is Wallace & Wallace. Um, Got to thank our friends at F Apparel who are getting ready for uh, the busy season heading into the holidays. Guys, if you're looking in your closet, knowing what's coming up, and realize you need to step up your menswear game, Take a trip down to 190 Smith Street and see the fellas at F Apparel. Custom suits beginning at 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories. And if you're in a wedding or in a wedding party or having your own wedding, 
Talk to them about a 15% discount for uh, all the guys when you get your suits for the big day at F Apparel. 190 Smith Street. Find out more or make an appointment online at F. That's E-P-H Apparel. Dot com. And just before we bring in Marat, big shout out to our friends Nick and Nikki and the Nick and Nikki DQ group. Four locations to get those delicious stack burgers and uh, world famous ice cream treats. DQ Northgate, DQ Pola Park, DQ St. Anne's, and DQ Niverville. And speaking of Niverville, their new Pita Pit in Niverville is open now. Healthy, delicious, fast, and fresh. Nothing like Pita Pit. Great catering as well. Find out more for Pita Pit Catering at Pita Pit in Niverville. All right, let's get Murat Atesh in here and get ready for next week's puck drop in Calgary. Murat, how are you? Great to have you back on the show. Hey, having a good one. Lots going on at the Hockey for All Center, almost at Iceplex today. Um, feeling good. Mark Shifley complimented my jacket today. That was nice. It's a good day. Good. The players pumping the media's tires. You don't get that too often. Hey, yeah, take imagine. it how take it however you can get it. Well, let's talk about today. Um, practice as well. I mean, certainly we'll get into. Well, let's save the blue line for a minute because that's a topic that might take up a little bit more time. But um, seems like Bones kind of had things as he's projecting for next Wednesday including Nikolai Ehlers, but still some relative uncertainty as to whether he's going to feel well enough to play in the game, which has to be concerning and probably frustrating to all parties involved. Yeah, it's a situation where when Rick Bonus talks about Nikolai Ehlers right now, you can tell he has empathy for what must be a frustrating situation for the player. The guy gets hurt, at, you know, misses a substantial amount of the playoffs, has a rough ending to his season, um, and then starts this way. And it's not that he blocked a shot. It's not that he, you know, stopped a scoring chance or any of those things that offer you a little bit of cachet in the NHL circle. It's that he had neck spasms while working out. And Bonus knows that he's at his best and Winnipeg's at his best if he's fully healthy all of the way. So he's got time for that. Bonus is being patient, but you have to also hear the undercurrent in that, Gosh, it's getting frustrating. He's, he wants to see his second line. He wants to see his power play units. He wants to see all those sorts of things. And Ehlers is unlikely to play tomorrow. So it certainly seems as though, you know, he's made some plans, hasn't got to live them through. And frustration is is boiling a little bit too with that one, I think. And it's also problematic because they're trying to work in a young player playing center for the first time in the National Hockey League. And you know that Nikolai Ehlers is going to be a, but potentially really the offensive catalyst on that line. Um, what have you thought about Cole Perfetti's training camp overall and his play in the preseason games at center? And what do you make of Cole's situation going into game one next week, um, likely without being able to play in any game action with Nick before uh, the game in Calgary? Yeah, Cole Perfetti has a challenge in front of him. And that would be true if he had been able to play in preseason games with the Ehlers on his side, along with Nino Niederreiter. And it's definitely true, given that they haven't been able to do that. I mean, the guy played center in the OHL for a large portion of his career there and excelled at it. I mean, in the final year of his draft year, I think he was in the top couple of players in the, sorry, in the final half of his draft year, he's in the top couple of players in terms of point production. He really controlled the game. He goes to the moose, starts as a wing, progressively moves more and more to center, and he develops an ability to control the offensive zone at center as well. So the guy has done it, but this is a harder job than he has ever had to do at any level because it's the NHL, it's inside the top six, and now he'll have to start the season, you know, figuring out chemistry instead of having had all the preseason opportunity. I thought he's mostly looked good. Um, that beautiful assist to Ville Hainala. I mean, everything about that play is what you hope for from Cole Perfetti as a center this year. His wingers did a great job to gain possession of the puck in the offensive zone, protecting it deep. That was Alex Iafalo and Nino Niederreiter. And that Niederreiter-Perfetti uh, chemistry, I think, is building. I think that that's a good thing that you've seen. They get him the puck in space, and then he uses his body. And he's not a big player. He's not a fast player. But he turns his hips away from the player that's defending him, he keeps the puck safe on his backhand. He reads the ice and he feathers a beautiful pass to Ville Hainala for the goal. Everything about that is the sort of thing you're hoping for. Perfetti making these high IQ 
plays from the middle of the ice to players in dangerous situations, and his wingers are doing some of the heavy duty work on the boards. Beautiful. He was also a step behind on a box out on a goal against, and he took a penalty that ended up leading to a goal against. So it stings maybe a little bit more. And I think that a reasonable expectation for Cole Perfetti this year is success at second line center because he'll have quality line mates and he's a quality player himself, but with growing pains. There's no way around there being a shift, a sequence of shifts, maybe even a game or two from here, there, the other place that, you know, look like a struggle for him. Winnipeg does not have Shifley and Dubois down the middle. You know, they don't have Shifley and Stastny down the middle. They're, they're breaking in a new player into that role, and that's going to come with some ups and downs, and I think he'll be all right as long as we manage expectations in, in a fair manner for him. Um, um, speaking of the top six while we're at it, um, it sounded like everyone was back on the ice. I mean, you mentioned you talked a little bit with Mark Shifley. How are the guys feeling, and how are they looking on the ice and uh, their level of preparedness for this final preseason game, but most importantly, the start of the season? Yeah, it was like the first time that I can remember, though camp is a bit of a blur already somehow, <laughs> that it wasn't littered with non-contact jerseys. There were none. No non-contact jerseys. And that was that was an amazing sight to see. And then uh, to have the full top line there, you know, recovered from their illness, that's a good sign to see. Uh, I'm sure that yesterday's day off helped on all fronts. And then the guys that got a night off on Monday, I'm sure that was a big deal for them too. Um you know, I did get to chat a little bit with Mark Shifley for a story I'll have coming out in the next little while, uh, something I've been working on for a while, to be honest, and just wanted to top off. And it, it was a really fun, good chat with him. So I think spirits are good on that top line. Um, and it was good to see them together as well. I really think Villardi, Connor, and Shifley think the game in similar ways, uh, the types of reads that they make and the way that they break down the offensive zone. So... You know, they have gotten some opportunity, not a lot to play together so far. Uh, as long as they can keep the game in the offensive zone, I think I'm going to be really excited. I think Jets fans will be really impressed by what they're able to do there. Well, there is going to be a lot on the shoulders of that line, especially with the uncertainty about the uh, about line too. And I mean, just as far as practice goes, um, you mentioned there's no non-contact jerseys. Um the fact that Ehlers is out there in a full contact jersey practicing at full bore, but unlikely to play, I have to admit that's one of the more strange things that we've heard when it comes to player availability that I can remember in a long time. Yeah, I mean, I get that. And Nikolai Ehlers has passed his medicals. He's like, he has been given medical clearance to play. Um, he is practicing what looks like full bore to me. So I would support that as well. I mean, he fired an absolute laser beam top glove uh, or actually top blocker. I think it was on, on Connor Hellebuck that just sort of had all of us going, Whoa, where did, where did that come from? Um, and yet he wakes up, you know, each day and he's got enough of that neck spasm ailment going still to decide that, you know, it's, he's not ready for game action. And um, that's a call that he's making. Only he knows his body. Only he knows what he feels like. I don't know if there's a, you know, a difference between like if he takes a big hit, is that going to aggravate something in that sort of regard or not? I, I, I mean, I, I don't know that, but the official word is that it's him that's keeping himself out of the lineup out of a sense of precaution as opposed to the medical clearance that he needs. I think that they've given him that already. Um, Murat, just finishing up on the forwards as we look ahead, um, how, given the way that it's set up right now, with the addition of Alex Iafallo onto the wing with Adam Lowry, how much of a difference maker do you think he will be in that role? And how much does that maybe um, increase the potential, the offensive potential of Adam Lowry's line compared to previous units? Yeah, I think Alex Iafallo has grown on me every single day in camp. Um, you know, from early days, you know, he's one of the early arrivals, even before camp was officially underway. And he was just, you know, one of the veterans figuring figuring things out. But like, it seems like every practice, every game, he's doing something that makes me think, oh, this is why his coaches loved him so much in Los Angeles. Uh, he's a smart player, a versatile player. He does have offensive ability as well. And we've seen with Adam Lowry, when he gets wingers that are of that quality, and you saw it with Nino Niederreiter at the end of last mm -hmm. season, that line starts to cook a little bit. That line starts to be able to score and outscore its opposition it's not just shut down, hope to win at 0-0. And I think that I follow on that line. 
assuming, you know, Mason Appleton seems like he's got that job locked up. I, I wondered if Nemestikov might climb into it at some point. It doesn't seem to be the case. But Lowry's in a good situation to play with his best pair of wingers in ages. And I think that is very important if Winnipeg's going to roll three or four lines deep, if they're going to use Lowry as a matchup line, meaning he gets big minutes relative to, you know, other third and fourth lines around the league. They've got to be able to produce. They have to. If they shut down other teams' players and it's, you know, 0-0 or they're, you know, minus two on the season at five on five, I mean, that's great if they can actually pop a goal now and again, like they started to do when it was Lowry and Niederreiter down the stretch, then you've got an advantage. That's what, in part, turned Winnipeg's season around and claimed that playoff spot and gave them a fighting chance, at least early, against Vegas. And I think that Winnipeg needs it very badly this season. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And Appleton starting on that line. I, um, I'm interested in your thoughts about how his his situation might be a little different this year just with the depth and how many other players they are fighting for spots. Uh, and certainly, we Vlad Nemetsnikov, I mean, you, that dude is plug-and-play pretty much everywhere in the lineup. Uh, I was thinking that they might go to Nemetsnikov at times playing with Lowry and Ayafalo. Um, What do you think Appleton needs to do to make sure that he's uh, staying alongside Adam Lowry in a more prominent role than he might get on a fourth line? Yeah, he's earned Rick Bonus's trust. You can tell that there is that trust between player and coach. And I think that there are some things working in Appleton's favor. One, he's played with Lowry for a few years now. I think one of the smartest things that he ever did was it was a few camps ago, I think it was coming out of the pandemic, where he essentially stapled himself to Lowry's hip before, during, and after practice days, always doing workouts and, and things like that all on the ice, um, the drills that they would run for each other after. And I think that it's really built a familiarity and a trust there that that has worked for him. Last season, one of the things that Bonus really praised was, can the winger get the puck moving um, out of his own zone when pressured along the boards? And Appleton's one of Winnipeg's few right-handed forwards, which helps in a certain degree getting the puck out of his own zone on the breakout. Um, Bonus is concerned about Winnipeg's ability to break the puck out so far this preseason. And... Appleton's willing to eat a hit in, in, in order to get that job done. So I think that that trust, his handedness, and the fact that this one small aspect of the game that Bonus is worried about with respect to the full team is something he believes Appleton can do. I think that that keeps him in that third line spot, even if, like, I think that Nemestikov is the more impactful player. He, he's a lefty, and maybe there's less, uh, less confidence in that, and maybe he wants, you know, Rick, Sorry, Rick Bonus wants Mason Appleton to seize that third line job. Um, at least to the Jets' credit, there's a there's multiple fourth liners now that you could imagine on third lines of Jets teams past. So Appleton had better, you know, do the things that he needs to do to maintain his hold on the job. Let's assume that it stays status quo. Um, how much better should the Jets' fourth line be with Nemetsnikov and Morgan Barron, who played a lot along the third line last year, along with the newcomer Campari. Maybe just thoughts on Campari and uh, what you've seen from him uh, during his limited time here in Winnipeg so far. I like uh, Campari's game so far. Uh, he's, he's been quick. He's been engaged in the play. Uh, he gives you a sense, whether this translates into the regular season or not, that he might be able to create from the fourth line. And that definitely applies to Nemesnikov, Morgan Barron as well. I mean, there are times last year when uh, his physicality was helping the Jets really control the puck in the offensive zone. And, you know, a lot of Jets' fourth lines of years past, you look at them and you look at their stat line at the end of the year and you're like, okay, well, I guess they were there, but they didn't put up points. And I recognize that's not all of their job. Bonus loves that they can do special teams, they're killing penalties, they're getting all those things done. But if you can't, like if that's the go get a coffee, go get a, you know, go take a break line, you know, when you're watching the game on TV, it's not enough. It's not enough to give bonus the reason to play them anymore. And this year, it at least looks like they should be able to create, um, produce some goals for the Winnipeg Jets. That should give everybody a break if if that trust is built and earned and they produce. And um, I, I'm curious to see how Winnipeg uses its depth because it's a deeper team. Uh, even it's a deeper team this year than it's been in ages. And that only holds true as long as those guys produce. All right, Murat, let's get to the blue line. And we've all been talking about it. 
We've got a young, highly drafted Scandinavian defenseman that we're talking about his status, where he'll be. So what's the deal with Elias Salmonson? Um, <laughs> we'll get to Billy in a minute, folks. Um, we all we all thought that he was back to Sweden at the end of his camp. He's been assigned to the Moose. We were reading an article from Sweden yesterday that essentially says that this is, I don't, I don't know whether we want to call it a loophole, whether we want to call it, um, you know, we didn't weren't totally familiar with this new agreement with Sweden. Um, he's on the moose right now. Can he stay there? Will he stay there? Um, can you explain what you know about this and what the Jets' options are with Elias? Yeah, in it's it's been a surprise to me too to to learn this over the last little while, and so I put that in the piece today. Um, in short. Winnipeg has the option to keep Ilya, Elias Solomonson with the AHL Manitoba Moose this season. Uh, it's under their control. Um, and that, you know, has been confirmed by his agent to me. And, you know, even even chatted with some folks over in Sweden as well. The why to that, uh, I'm still learning my way through it. I'm still waiting my way through it. I don't feel like an expert in this topic at all. But the NHL has an agreement with the SHL in Sweden about the terms about players that go from one league to another, um, who's eligible, why they're eligible. And my understanding with Solomonson is based on the current rules, it has something to do with Winnipeg signing him straight away after the draft before the July 15th deadline following his draft. And he's played a full season in Sweden since that time. And something about that seems to unlock a mechanism whereby Winnipeg can choose to play him in the AHL. Without that, well, then he'd have to go back to, to Sweden, and that's good for a Swedish club. They get to keep their young talent. Uh, you know, there's reasons to appreciate that that type of agreement. Uh, if they can, and they can, let's let's be clear about that, keep him with the Moose, there's a chance that Winnipeg's top defensive prospect plays for the Manitoba Moose this year. His name isn't Ville Hainala, and, you know, that makes that an even more exciting and dynamic team to watch. Well, let's go from one top, highly drafted Scandinavian defense prospect to another that's been around longer. Billy, it's been probably the biggest topic on this program for the last couple of days. With uh, Have you seen his training camp as uh, highly as uh, most fans have? And I mean, we heard from Rick Bonus saying a lot was going to be determined from these last two games. Um, what you, From your perspective, Marat, what is at stake for Billy in this game tomorrow and the likelihood of him... Well, first off, starting on the roster to begin the season, and if he's on the roster, then in the lineup. Um, yeah, let me let me go backwards. Zero chance he starts. I I think it's a zero chance he starts inside that top six. Uh, Rick Bonus has complimented his game. We can all see that this is as close as he's ever been to you know NHL level play in all three zones. I rate Hanales Camp well. I don't know if I rate it as well as the fan base, which has really been waiting for a player of Hanela's uh, skill set and ability to make that leap and, you know, have valid concerns about the way he's been developed, especially when he wasn't playing at all um, on the taxi squad, if we want to go back that far. So he's been a lightning rod of a player. He's come in and he's had a very good camp. This is perhaps, not perhaps, this is the best camp that Villa Hanela has had as a Winnipeg Jet. He's shown what he can do in all three zones. Um, he's defended against bigger players, which is something that he's not supposed to be able to do. He always seems to have a stick on puck or, you know, even if he's getting muscled around or pushed around in those board battles or what have you, Winnipeg has ended up with the puck more often than not. So when I watch it, it doesn't feel safe because he looks off balance and he looks like the other guy's stronger and, you know, maybe about to get better position. But you count it all up and you're like, well, Winnipeg got the puck that time and that time, not that one. But and then you go by the end of the night, his metrics look great. His his actual level of battles one look good as well. And you're like, well, this guy, he certainly hasn't played himself off the team. The one thing that keeps him away, I mean, Rick Bone is saying today, you know, in the scrum that I came from leading up into this this chat is that none of the veterans have played their way off the team. None of the players on last year's team have played their way off the team. And it seems to me that it's very much down to the wire as to whether he'll stay on that roster or not. Um, I think he's earned it. 
It doesn't seem as though they're in a hurry to demote anybody to make uh, make room for him. Uh, if Schmidt is hurt and can't play, well, that's a different thing. Now there's an IR opening. Now you get to keep an extra guy. That would keep him around. I think the story is yet to be determined, but I think it's less than 50-50. He starts with the Jets despite his great play. Interesting. Um, I mean, it is all part of a, of a bigger question, um, of which he's a big, big piece how this team looks, are they keeping the eight defensemen, and what are the moves they have to make to even get to that point? Um, Declan Chisholm was kind of skating in. I mean, if you take from what we did from the reports of it, I mean, kind of looks like nine of nine when it comes to the defense depth chart right now. A um, couple of the, the chatters have made a good point. Of, I mean, uh, Bernard Docker, who had big numbers last year in the American Hockey League. I believe the number they quoted was 35 points in 41 games. Um, passed through waivers yesterday. Um, do you think that Winnipeg Jets take the chance that Declan Chisholm could be picked up if he's assigned to the Manitoba Moose? I mean, big bigger question is, I mean, what are the moves that you expect to be made before the 11th? Yeah, I think it's possible they waive Declan Chisholm. Certainly, I, I really do. And, you know, he is behind an awful lot of guys and, you know, a, a little bit banged up from time to time throughout camp, hasn't always been able to show his maximum self. When he's gotten into the lineup, he's played well, particularly offensively. Uh, defensively, I don't think he's there yet in terms of NHL uh, NHL ability. Could that come if they keep him around and just give him a few more reps and, he, you know, all, all of that sort of stuff? Certainly, I think it could come, but it hasn't been so explosive that, that they're going to risk or that they would automatically have to risk a more established player for him. Um, if Winnipeg is going to waive him, which I think is completely within the realm of possibility here, I, I wonder about the timing of it because right. If a team claims him on waivers, they've got to keep him on the roster for a certain amount of time. Right. And they got to, they've got to hold on to him um, right now. Teams haven't cut all of the cuts that they're going to make at their camps. And I'm thinking that they still are looking at, you know, their seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth guys at various camps around the league. It's almost easier to pass a guy through now than waiting until the last possible day. Um, so I'm thinking, like with Jeff Riviel, which just happened, that if, if that's coming, maybe it should come relatively soon. Um, yeah, so I think that maybe the, the moves that I expect are that Logan Stanley and Kyle Capobianco get kept, that Declan Chisholm gets waived, and Hainala goes down unless an IR spot opens up an opportunity for him as well, which is kind of boringly just like how you would have drawn it up in August if you thought it through. Okay, you know what? Terrible example. We mixed it up. It was 35 penalty minutes. So maybe the, the Bernard Docker comparison to Chisholm that I just made – Scratch that from the record, everybody. <laughs> Erase that. Um, but to your point, though, Marat, and I think this is what the Jets were trying to do last year with Johnny Kovacevic. I mean, you make those moves at a time where the other 31 teams are all squeezing their heads going, okay, how do we take care of just what we have right now? I mean, there won't be a ton of markets that that guy is definitely on the club, but it only takes one, and that is you know, the danger of, you know, exposing a player that I think they would be similar to last year when they lost Johnny would be, it'd be really unfortunate to, to lose a player like that that's shown what he has so far with the organization without ever really getting a chance to show what he can do at the NHL level. Yeah, it's just, it's just a sad story. That, that, that would be it. It wouldn't be a, you know, a, a disastrous story. You, you'd feel happy for the guy he got an NHL opportunity somewhere. Um, that would be good for him, just like Jansen Harkins getting claimed by Pittsburgh right now. Well, good for him. Let's let's see if they keep him up there and uh, and what he can do. That would be a positive story for the human being. He's become an NHL player, and that's what waivers is meant to do to stop pe stop teams from being able to hoard talent that could be NHL capable in other places. So that would be the system working in a way. But from the Winnipeg Jets perspective, you drafted the guy, you you developed him, you you, know, you watched his junior career play out. You brought him on to the moose. You've watched him excel for you at the moose level. And then what? And then you lose him for nothing because another team happened to have a need there. I guess that's part of the inefficiency that comes with the system. But 
you know, it, it would just have to burn. If they lost two guys like that in consecutive seasons, it would just be frustrating for them, I think. And at some point, too, if you really want to follow it all of the way to the like to the nth degree, and I'm not really advocating for this, but but why have scouts? Why have scouts and why have development if uh, if your second, third, fourth, fifth rounders have to go through that sort of rigmarole years later and you don't end up promoting them to the team because you signed or you you picked up a Cal Capo Bianco type because there are that many good quality NHL players or NHL cusp players available. Maybe it really just is about the first rounders. Maybe you don't need a development program and to spend all that money in in, in terms of uh, advantages for the moose and things like that. Um, I'm just saying that. I don't believe that. I don't think that's the way that, that a team should go. But it's a sort especially of question a, you start asking. Especially a quote-unquote draft and develop team. That has, yeah. has always been the mantra of this club. They're going to draft well. They're going to develop them with their club and they're going to get them ready and you know hopefully turn them into nhl players and part of that would be playing at some point in the nhl with the club and seeing whether they can cut it and where they are and where they are at what what is the likelihood of a trade involving any member of the defense before next week do you think yeah that's a great question i'm not hearing anything about it but that doesn't mean that uh, that it's not being discussed in some way shape or form um they're, the Jets are in a perfect spot to consider making a trade, I think. You know, they have, if you assume Capobianco and, and Stanley are your seven and, and your eight, and if they're both healthy, and if the Jets, you know, would prefer them and the NHL to, to Declan Chisholm and Ville Hainala, then you might feel like the Jets have an excess there. And if teams are willing to spend any amount of assets on those players – then maybe you do pick up an extra pick. Maybe it's a way to um, get something back from this position instead of losing somebody on waivers for nothing. Um, it would make sense. I think if some team out there were willing to offer the Jets, you know, a really substantial thing for some of the veterans like Sh- like Schmidt or Pionk, like fans often ask for, I mean, you know, that would maybe be a ship that has sailed. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say is it would make sense to me if something happened. I'm not hearing anything as front burner, uh, and it might just be status quo all over again. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I've been sort of highly skeptical. Uh, and listen, I, I'm a lot more optimistic about Neil Pionk's ability to uh, kind of bounce back next season, be more like the guy that you know we saw in the playoffs and the guy that we saw you know a couple seasons ago before going through his tough time. And I think that if he does that, that will be a huge boost to the club. But considering his last couple seasons and his salary and Nate Schmidt's salary, I mean, I don't think it would be any big package. I mean, I would be surprised if there was a team that was just even able to take on that salary, Murat. Even if they had a high opinion of the player and thought that they could come in, I mean, it probably would in some ways be money in, money out, and what that does to you. Um, but one way or the other, I mean, I don't think there's an argument that a trade just to loosen it up with one of those players to give um, a little bit more of a path for the young guys to come in would be a good thing for the Winnipeg Jets. But it's not like we're seeing a flurry of activity all around the league and the Jets are the only ones that's quiet. I mean, this is a, a situation that's unique and we know it's bottom line. It's hard to trade veteran players that are making that much money with term on their contract. Yeah, it's. We're, we're on the precipice of exiting the flat cap era of the NHL, but um, and it hasn't been 100% flat. It's increased a little bit. But I think that pandemic economics still play a little bit of a role here in terms of an overwhelming percentage of cap space around the league has been eaten up. And now everybody's favorite cap broker, the Arizona Coyotes, seem like they're actually trying to, you know, to trying to compete and things like that. I don't, I don't think that it would be easy for a team to trade a uh, you know, a veteran with a lot of money and term on their contract at this stage. I also think that we've seen, like Neil Pionk is a really fascinating example. And I, and I wrote a little bit about that at the piece or in the piece today, but Winnipeg has seen him deliver top four quality results. So it would have a reason to believe he can do it again. It's been a couple of years. Like you can go through most of the last two seasons and, and really question whether he can win those top four matchups um, he did it for small stretches, including down the stretch. And, you know, he was Winnipeg's leader in a lot of ways on the blue line once Josh Morrissey came out of the lineup. So there's enough there that you wonder, you know, I would at least understand a bit of patience on Winnipeg's part. 
I know fans are running out of patience. I know if Pionk has a, a really miserable year this year, you know, I might, I might speak a different tune. But we saw Josh Morrissey have two very subpar seasons for his ability level. Um, we saw Adam Lowry a couple years ago when his dad was coached that season, you know, take a step back and then, you know, just take a, a modest step forward again last year and things like that. Sometimes players' performance goes up and down and they get soured on a little bit. And then you find out that there was some reason why, you know, why some something that seems to explain it all. And they return to a previous level of performance. Um, you know, if he doesn't play that well, then playing him 22 minutes a night like the Jets did last year, that would be a mistake. But at least... Even if it seems like I've had too much patience on this front, I still I still have that for a player in Neil Pionk's situation, um, especially with the market being what it would be. Uh, just before we go, we haven't talked a lot about the uh, the, the battle for the thirteenth forward, if you will. Um, what have you thought about Parker Ford throughout? Who I mean, I'll be honest, I don't think was on many people's radars about still being around at this point of training camp. Um, but especially after a couple goals, although ironically, I think both assisted by Parker Ford is David Gustafson, the guy that has uh, won that 13th forward job. Yeah, I think the job is David Gustafson's. And as I recall, you know, Parker Ford can be sent to the moose without needing waivers. That's a very easy decision from a keep all of your players perspective. Um, I think it would be easy for Parker Ford to have a really hardworking, impactful uh, start to his, you know, continued start to his Moose career and maybe be in that conversation for bottom six call-ups the same way that a Mikey Isamont was last year. Um, he's a hardworking player. He's fun to watch. He can win battles against players much bigger than he is. It's been, you know, it's been one of the more entertaining stories. And I go back to, I think it was March when he signed that Moose contract and I texted a couple people uh, in college, scouts, various, uh, various guys. And, you know, the, the message was this guy is a pain in the butt to play against. Uh, he never stops working. He's tireless. We circle his number on the board or, you know, we believe that he, he's a, he's so hardworking. He could be a, a depth player at the NHL level as well. So there was some optimism in, in the circles that knew him well. And the question was, does he create enough to justify an NHL roster spot? At least through preseason he has like he, he, he certainly has been in, in those moments. I still think, to Gustafson's credit, that he's your best uh, best 13th forward option. He'll kill penalties. He's got he's got the well-rounded game. And even on some of those Parker Ford assists, you rewind and David Gustafson's made a nice defensive play to kick things off as well. So I think that's the right choice, and I think it's the choice Winnipeg will make. Man, great reads uh, available for Jet fans right now in the Athletic. Marat, thanks for doing this. And uh Fill people in. I imagine a very busy week and lots of content coming up as we uh, await final decisions on this roster and then uh, get ready for uh, one of 82 next Wednesday in uh, Calgary, Alberta. Yeah, I mean, certainly a busy and exciting time to, to sort through all of these. Uh, the piece you mentioned today is the 10 biggest questions left for the Winnipeg Jets to answer this season. And certainly a lot of the stuff that we talked about is in there. Uh, plenty of detail there and some some questions, some more questions as well, because this is a very, very captivating season for the Winnipeg Jets. The other stuff that I've got on the go right now, I mean, camp has been a really great opportunity to have some of those, I want to say personal, uh, real life conversations with some of the Jets players. And I've had some really good sit downs that I'm just inching forward towards those finished feature stories that I really love to share with readers. And, uh, you know, step by step, we'll get those those out to everybody as well. Very much looking forward to those as well. Uh, you have a great day and uh, enjoy the final preseason game tomorrow. And uh, can't wait to do it next week as we get ready for uh, a full season of Winnipeg Jets hockey here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Right on, Huss. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marat. There he is, our good friend, Marat Atesh. Make sure you're subscribing to The Athletic for all of Marat's content. And you can follow him on Twitter at WPG Marat. All right, we are going to do some Bomber content coming up and check in with the voice of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, Derek Taylor. Of course, our Bomber reports always brought to you by Princess Auto, proud sponsors of the Blue and Gold and Winnipeg Sports Talk, and the place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. You can pop by and see them at one of two Winnipeg locations, Panit Road or Portage Avenue West. 
You can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. What a summer it has been for our friends at Consolidated Supply. But the work does not end as we get into the fall. <clears throat> Consolidated Supply are the leaders in irrigation systems, artificial turf, and golf carts as the exclusive club car dealer in Manitoba, but also has some other great options for your property, including hot tubs and amazing outdoor kitchens. They're also the leaders in small engine parts and repair. So much Consolidated Supply has waiting for you. Check them out at their showroom, open to the public, 1395 Nyackle Road East, or find out more online at cte.ca. Uh, as we get ready for puck drop on the season, great time to get down to Royal Sports and get your new Jets merch for the upcoming season. Everybody knows Royal Sports is the true number one sports superstore in town. For over 40 years, family-owned with thousands of pieces of Jets merchandise, including many exclusives, a great bomber section as well, Blue Jays, tons of NFL, and of course they are the hockey experts and have been for 40 years as well. When it comes to everything hockey, Royal Sports is the spot. Pop by and see them, 750 Pemina Highway. Follow them on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina. And, uh, hey, Blue Jays baseball this afternoon. Hopefully tomorrow as well. No better place to watch that uh, your local Boston Pizza hooked up with the boys right after the game yesterday. BP enjoyed all the great happy hour specials from 3 till 6 while watching the game. And, of course, those ice-cold schooners, world-famous BP wings, gourmet pizzas, and the latest from the Boston Pizza feature menu as well. And, hey, if you can't make it down for the game today, you can always get the great taste of Boston pizza hot and fresh delivered to your door by ordering online at bostonpizza.com. All right. We still have more to get to because we've got a big football game on Friday and Bombers practicing, getting ready to leave to Vancouver, I believe tomorrow. Um, can't let Derek Taylor, voice of the Bombers, get on that plane without a visit on Winnipeg Sports Talk to set up the battle for the Western Division between the Lions and Bombers Friday night in BC. Friday, it is on BC Place, the battle for the West. Uh, it's about as big a game as we've seen in the regular season in a long, long time. Not just for the Bombers, Derek, but I'd argue in the entire Canadian Football League. I'm, I've been trying to think, right, Hassa, about, because you're not understanding it, right? Like, the winner of this game essentially wins the West. It's, it's essentially done at that point, right? And you go... Or anything even close and the closest i could get was there was an early october game in 2019 bombers and riders bombers went to the riders for the third meeting of the season and if the riders won they were going to take over first place they did there was a huge shaq evans touchdown on winston rose and you know running into first place go the riders and they do eventually 13 and 5 win the west but even that one there were still weeks afterward where calgary could have kooked things up or winnipeg could have come back and and change things this one is i mean the the tiny chance that the winner of this game loses its next two and the loser wins its next two that's the only thing that keeps the winner of this game from clinching first place in the west historically a 70 percent chance to go into the gray cup like this is oh, it's, oh by the way it's the two mop candidates it's maybe the two best receiving cores in the league uh one team blew out the other and then the other team blew out the first one you know this is this game is incredible. This the million storylines in this game. It, it truly is um, uh, the rubber match between the two best teams in the West Division all season long. And listen, I know that the Bombers probably feel like they uh, gave one or two away getting here, but the fact that they both have the identical record, I mean, it is a playoff game before the playoffs um, in a lot of ways because not only does the winner take a one game advantage. But they have the tiebreaker, which, as you just laid out, pretty much all but guarantees uh, one home game. And I'll say this from a Bomber perspective. Um, like, BC's a very, very good football team. Um, the Bombers are battle-tested. They know what the playoffs is all about. But the thing that can't be overstated is it's a hell of a lot harder to beat the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in the middle of November in a dome than it is at IG Field with that crowd that you know is going to be showing up for any playoff game that the Bombers are in. Yeah, that's that's the one thing you I think you'd have to consider is 
What are the chances BC wins wins the uh, West Final on the road? What are the chances the Bombers win the West Final on the road in in favorable, more favorable conditions potentially in Vancouver? You know, well, I like the Bombers' chances on the road better than like BC's chances on the road, which goes back to the importance uh, of this game and advantage BC for having this 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 meeting on Friday at, at home. It's yeah, I, I suspect. Though I don't suspect any of the players or coaches will talk about it. Every single one of them knows exactly what's on the line on Friday. I don't know if Vernon Adams and Zach Kolaris will talk about it, but people around them at the very least know exactly what's on the line. The winner of this game is probably all going to get our votes for MOP. If one guy has three picks and the other guy has three touchdowns, eh, it's probably going to sway our MOP votes at the end of the year. It just... You can't even, uh, there's just, there's so many parts. We can go off in a million directions, Huss. <laughs> we certainly can. Well, let's focus in on the Bombers. And I will tell you, DT, we were doing the show yesterday, right around the time that you put out the tweet that Janarian Grant was back at practice. And I can tell you that was very well received by Bomber fans in the Winnipeg Sports Talk chat. Um, how did he look? Um, are we expecting him to be able to play? And in your mind, how big of a game changer is he on that return game, considering the issues they've had since he's been out? Yeah, so to get Janarian back to practice yesterday, they had to pull him off the six-game injured list. And you go, okay, well, they probably, with the bye week coming off, if he wasn't real close, would you have pulled him off? And to me, the answer is no. I, if you take him off six-game, he's got to be close because – there's still a chance you could save that all a salary on six games. So to me, he's got to be right close. We saw him running sprints at practice last week. Yesterday at practice, the only one day where we got to observe practice this week, he looked good. Like he was returning punts. He was doing drills with receivers, you know, speed drills, change of direction drills, all the stuff you kind of worry about with an ankle injury. You go, oh, no, that looked good. Okay, well, that looked good. Is there any any hint of a limp? Well, I don't really see it. Uh, and you go, is he likely to be, I mean, whatever pain killing methods are available to football players, you probably wouldn't use them for a Tuesday practice. You go, this, this all seems super encouraging. So uh, to me, the only, the only thing that keeps him from playing on Friday, and this is just me guessing would be if he has some sort of setback this week, because what we saw at practice yesterday makes me think that Janarian is ready to go. And that dude is champing at the bit. When we talk to him, he said, he's like a gazelle just scratching I'm just ready. I'm just ready to run. So that is fantastic news. Um, I mean, all shouts to, to Greg McRae and Jamal Parker. They just haven't in the punt, especially, the, I mean, the punt return game has been very noticeable. It's just not been anywhere near the same, right? Like we're all comparing, we'll all compare everything to that week two return Janarian had against Saskatchewan and just the audaciousness and skill and talent of a guy who's able to make that, that return happen where, backtrack spin cut all the way back and then loop around and get to the end zone totally exhausted for an incredible touchdown was there a part of greg mccray or jamal parker in the return game that made you think that was possible no not really they might have it but we didn't really see it mccray had problems you know just catching the ball parker i think did a little better whether numbers wise or not but just the gap between a regular guy and Janarian Grant in the Bombers return game, I think is substantial. And this is a guy who returned a punt for a touchdown against the Lions in the West final, returned a kickoff for a touchdown against the Lions in, in week five. It was last year. Like, he's done it against the Lions. He's done it in BC. He's done it in a variety of situations and in, on, you know, on, on different kinds of kicks. Like he's a real, he's a real weapon. It doesn't hit every game, but when it does, it's going to change the game. No doubt about that. Derek Taylor with us getting ready for Bombers Lions on Friday night at BC Place. One thing that I think is great for the league, and as big of a buzzkill as it was that we didn't get the Bombers and the best of the Argos going at it last week, both of these teams seem to be incredibly healthy for this time of the year. You, you, you cannot count on that in professional football this deep into the regular season. Yeah, like the, the Bombers might be down one guy from their starting 24 when the game kicks off. And yeah, BC's got its receiving core back. They've got their running back. They get Sook Chung back so that offensive line looks healthy. Their defensive line rotation is pretty much intact. Um, yeah, and they, they, they might make some changes in the back six uh, just from quality of play. 
But yeah, like how it's it's super rare that a team like the Bombers is as healthy as they are just on its own. But to add that to a team they're trying to play, you're you're right. Like we we're always caught with these. Well, this guy was hurt, so it, it doesn't matter as much. Or these guys were injured, so I don't really put much stock into that. This is almost the best you could possibly have hoped for in a in an evaluation of how will the West playoffs go. Well, here we go. Let's let's see your best and our best. And I've I've thought for a while that the Bombers' best players at playing at their peak will beat all the other teams in the CFL with their best players at their peak. I don't have a ton of examples to prove that though, and we're we're going to get pretty close to having one on Friday night. Will they at their best? be able to beat the Lions at what appears to be their best. Well, it, you know, and it's a great segue into uh, how this game will be won. And, uh, you know, I said this on yesterday's Winnipeg Sports Talk, you know, at DT. I, I, I've got a lot of confidence in the Bomber offense. Um, I mean, Caleros, the season Brady Oliveira is having, the weapons that Zach has at his disposal. Um, I think the Bombers are going to get theirs. The Bomber defense at times has been up and down. I mean, they have looked for a good period of time like that championship level. Um, they've also started the way they did last week against Toronto, uh, the Edmonton game. I mean, there has been some times where they just haven't looked maybe as focused um, as they need to be, certainly to beat a team like BC. That being said, I think the, uh, the body of work of this defense will tell you that they will come to play, but um, do you agree that the Bomber defense versus that BC offense could very well be where this game is uh, won or lost? 100%. Do you want to do you want to replicate a moment from the broadcast booth with me last week? Sure. Okay, and it, it goes to what you were saying about this Bomber defense. Uh, you be me, I'll be Doug Brown, because we look just alike according to people who come by. I don't, I don't see it, but anyway. Um <laughs> Tell me that the Bombers are the number one scoring defense in the Canadian Football League. They've allowed the fewest opponent offensive points. And I'll be I'll be Doug Brown's reaction to when I said that statement to him. All right, uh, DB, this is the number one scoring defense in the Canadian Football League. <laughs> Podcast his mind, listeners, he rubbernecked his entire head around in a 360. Yeah, I, I said that to Doug because they'd allowed seven. It was something like 17 opponent offensive points a game, fewest in the CFL. And and Doug's brain just broke for a minute and going, wait, is that right? Because and, and I know exactly where he was coming from because there are points where it doesn't feel like the best defense in the Canadian Football League. Right. It just it just doesn't feel like it. Whatever the numbers say, you go. Well, Jake Dolagala put 32 on them. What are we doing? What really? Okay, well, well, what about the first BC one? What's what's happening in these weird games where Edmonton's getting out to, you know, putting up 15 offensive points en route to, to 22 nothing lead? It just it it's it's super weird. And I don't know that I can entirely put my finger on what the cause of it is, but they are strong. But okay, well, that guy's running wide open behind the defensive backs. What's 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 happening here? Nothing feels as Nothing will ever feel as rock solid as 2021 was, right? I think that year they allowed under 13 offensive points per game. It, it was crazy how good that team was. But this one is five points worse than that. And it just, it feels like at any point something could break free. Uh, Toronto, you know, kind of walked down the field for a couple touchdowns last week with Cameron Dukes at quarterback. And without, you know, AJ Allette came out after that one drive and you go, should this be why is this happening again? Why it are it just seemed like they weren't ready to play? Like they thought it's almost like exactly. they thought, oh, Chad Kelly's sitting as well as everybody else. And after a little while, I was like, okay, guys, like let's get it together here. We we gotta win this football game. Um, but I mean it what listen, and maybe the decisions of the Argos kind of dictated that they weren't gonna get the best of it, but that was a game the bombers needed to win. And I mean, let's face it, the defense, as great as it's been for as long as it's been did not seem ready to play at the level that they're certainly going to need to be on Friday coming out of the gate last week at home. Yeah. It, it, w you wonder why are they, why are they still having problems with scrambly quarterbacks, right? Young quarterbacks on whom there's no film, but have shown scrambling potential. Why are those guys still causing them troubles? Because they've already seen Taylor Powell and Trey Ford and Dustin Crum and go, okay, well, what's, you know, I'm not able to figure that out myself, but so I'm like, okay, well, well why is that still a thing? Okay. Well, let's watch if that's a thing coming up because in this game, Vernon Adams, he's not young anymore, but Vernon still has the potential to be a real, real threat when he decides to scramble. He's been great at throwing the football, 
So it's it's a secondary option for him, but he can punish you in that way. So you go, okay, will they be ready for that? It, it's super, it, it is strange. Um, Willie Jefferson, we've been counting the stat now for three weeks. It's eight games since Willie Jefferson's had a sack. And there are, it might be two games in a row, there was a forced fumble, but the, the CFL's base stat line was just all zeros for Willie. It didn't count forced fumble, but you're like, no tackles and no sacks. And okay, what's happening here um jackson jeffcoat missed the missed the one game in hamilton injured what's happening there what happened to interior pressure from the defense um it, the two, the two ugliest defensive performances of the year the first bc game and that hamilton game not coincidentally yeah. both games jackson jeffcoat was out yeah and fair enough and, and those games in the middle right where jeffcoat was back after missing the first three games he and willie were just savage savage and ricky walker was getting in there jake thomas was on route to five sacks and here's cam lawson with i think cam's on three plus an interception you go okay well that's that's where it was at its peak but uh much like how the bombers contained bc's defensive line in their second meeting it feels like the bombers defensive front has been contained these last few weeks okay well that that then hurts coverage and there's there's so many parts that go into this how will coverage be affected by the interception leader not being able to play and jamal parker has to go in and the two guys have to flip sides and where do they go if they're injured it's it's been a real strange year for the defense and it, it just all comes back to it it, it it hurts my brain a little bit right Huss? like they're the best in the league but I don't know that I have a hundred percent confidence in them. And those things, those things don't really work side by side in my mind. I don't know how they go together, but they are this year's bomber team. Yeah. You know what? I, I think most bomber fans will have confidence that they can go in and get it done. They have certainly earned that level of confidence with the level that they played, you know, over the last number of years. But I'll tell you what, this has got a this has got a real neat feeling. The game opened up BC two point favorites. I'm seeing it's one and a half right now. I mean, I think we're gonna get maybe close to a pick'em, to be honest, by the time this game goes off, with two healthy football teams and so much on the line. Uh, it honestly doesn't get any better than this when you talk about a regular season game in the Canadian Football League. Before we go, DT, is there a player on the Bombers? And I mean, we'll talk Zach Caleros, Brady Oliveira. I mean, it's quite obvious we know the the usual suspects, but is there maybe a guy that we don't talk about enough that, in your opinion, could be a uh, a major factor more than people might expect on Friday night? Oh, I would put this on, if you make me pick somebody, I would put this on Evan Holm. I'm going to go with the halfback Evan Holm. I because, love it. I was going to say the same thing. Great yeah, call on this. What a like, season he's had, by the way. Fantastic. And, I mean, he, Dietrich Nichols is an absolute monster stud at that boundary halfback spot. I I just think BC knows that, and they're not gonna. They might. They're gonna try Evan Holm before they try Dietrich Nichols, in my mind. Oh, and by the way, they're gonna try him with Dominic Rhymes and Keon Hatcher. Hatcher was a monster last week. Rhymes has been a monster for multiple years. I oh, we're gonna try him on the jump ball. We're gonna throw him this fade corner up, whatever. Okay, well, Evan Holm did it real well against BC and Justin McInnes. I don't. I don't remember him jump balling Dominic Rhymes, for example, or having to work on Rhymes, who's a big cat, right? So uh, that that to me is the one. BC's slot weapons, all their weapons, but their slot weapons are so dangerous that that then puts pressure on the Cramdies and the Holmes on that field side. So uh, that's that's where I'm going to be curious to see. Uh, I don't. BC doesn't have a real consistent run game, so I'm not concerned of it. From that respect, but yeah, they can really do it through the air. And I, I mean, they know BC knows what Winston Rose is, Dietrich Nichols, Alexander, and company. Uh, the other three guys, and in the slots, I think are the place to place to watch. DT cannot wait for Friday. I know Bomber fans are fired up too. Uh, what time will the coverage begin for people that want to get every second of the pregame festivities before the biggest game of the year? Nine o'clock kickoff. Normally, we would start at seven o'clock, but Special 631. It's such a big game. We're having a big pregame show with myself and Doug Brown and uh, Ed Tate and Greg Mackling and, and the gang. So 630 pregame on CJOB. Cannot wait for Friday night, Derek. Uh, Derek, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks, brother. All right. Good stuff with DT. Appreciate him jumping on the program today. Cannot wait for that game on Friday night. 
But um, we've got a lot to, to get to before then. Jays this afternoon, and hopefully they can get a W tonight, tomorrow. And, of course, tomorrow night's final preseason game down at, uh, at Canada Life Centre. Speaking of the Jets, gang, uh, by the way, thanks to everyone. We've got some more subs today. We are just about 20 away from 10,000. So if you haven't already, hit that red subscribe button. And uh, if you're a new to WST and a big Jets fan, like most of our watchers and or viewers and listeners are, um, think about joining us and the Winnipeg Sports Talk crew for Winnipeg Jets Ticket Pack. It's a four-gamer, gang. It begins with the return of Pierre-Luc Dubois on October 17th. Connor McDavid and the Oilers on Thursday, November 30th. Saturday night, Toronto Maple Leafs in January. And Thursday against the Calgary Flames in April. We picked four great games. Uh, 375 all in with us. We've sold out the seats that were available in Section 316. So we've got some more available in Section 317 right across. We're going to have a get-together before all the games in the bar just outside our section. And... With your ticket, you'll get a free beer, drink, soda, or water at every game as well and a chance to win some great prizes with us. So uh, hit the link in the description <clears throat> if you're with us on YouTube. And if you're listening on the podcast, just go to winnipegsportstalk.com. Click on the link. We'll take you right through there. Grab a couple seats and join us. Cannot wait for the 17th to see the WST gang for our first game up in the upper bowl and uh, having a lot of fun. Uh, Winnipeg Jets games is here. And don't forget, party in the plaza before the home opener on the 14th. A free all-ages celebration to kick off the season. Tons of entertainment, DJs, bands, cultural performances, food and beverages available from the Hargrave Street Market vendors. All the mascots, the promo team will be out there with prizes and giveaways. So uh, make a plan to get to the home opener and get there early for the event on the 14th, beginning at noon in the plaza before the 3 o'clock puck drop on the Jets' second game of the season and first home game, welcoming Paul Maurice and the Florida Panthers to town. Um, hey, got to give a shout-out to our friends at Canadian Club. Of course, uh, no Bomber game this week. Bombers will be back on the 21st of October to take on Edmonton Elks in their final home game, and hopefully that is officially to clinch the Western Division that will be the case if they win their game on Friday against the BC Lions. Canadian Club's the official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Pick it up at IG Field and, of course, your favorite local Manitoba Liquor Mart. And don't forget CC and Ginger Ale also available at beer stores around the city. And, um, well, speaking of IG Field and Canada Life Centre, uh, our favorite local beer, the great folks at Little Brown Jug, continue to grow and are now not only in IG Field as partners with the Bombers, but Canada Life Centre is one of the new local beers available at all Winnipeg Jets games, both the nor on the lower bowl, in the north end, around where the old Moxie's was, and in the south end, there's Craft Beer Corners and Craft Beer Corner upstairs. Outside Section 310, I have a feeling there'll be quite a few WSTers walking a couple sections over to pick up 1919s when we get the gang together for those games this year. Of course, Little Brown Jug is at William Avenue. Pop by the brewery and tap room to taste all the great Little Brown Jugs. And, of course, you can also order online with local delivery at littlebrownjug.ca. Uh, all right, let's get Michael Remus back in here. We've got a couple of more things to uh, to uh, to get to. Actually, I think there's a little bit more bones that we didn't get a, a chance to get to before um, Greg Wyshynski that we might want to slide in before we hit the cool bet lines and get ready to go watch this Blue Jays game. Sure, you want me to hit these last couple? I got a couple more clips if you want to just touch on them. Yeah, um, we'd love to. Sure. Uh, I guess they were talking about team identity, and uh, Paul Friesen asked Rick Bonus uh, about the points uh, of the team's identity. Uh, well, we made huge strides last year on our defensive side of the puck. We, and that, that's what got us into the playoffs, the improvements we made without the puck. Um, we, we, I, think, I think our 
analytics were better than were better than what our actually goals for. But we're we're gonna we're a team that's gonna create offense from team really good team defense, which means pressure them all over the ice. And when we're, we're going and we're skating, that's how that's what we look like. We're, we're we're pressuring the opposition, we're creating turnovers, and we're going on the attack in a hurry. Or they're coming into our zone, and we're very aggressive. We're ending plays, and we're getting breakouts, and we get going. We uh, we struggled for me so far with the breakouts. So we can't play fast if we don't break the puck out. So every day we're putting a lot of focus on breaking the puck out. So that's what we will look like. Go back, get the puck, go hard, get going on the, on the attack, and the same thing in the neutral zone. If we turn the puck over and get offense from good defense. All right, so there's Bones on uh, the team identity, what he's looking to get out of his team when the season gets going next week, and hopefully uh, do that tomorrow against the Ottawa Senators in the final preseason game over at Canada Life Centre. Um, here's one more from Bones, and he talked about the remaining players left in camp. You've had a good look at everybody. Like, if you had a, you know, through circumstances, have you had a good enough look at everybody now that you feel real comfortable with what you have with the 29 that are left here? Yeah, I'm very comfortable with what the 29 that are, what they bring to the table. Uh, so we're very comfortable with that. Now, are some of the, the young guys who, who've looked really good? Are they ready for that next? Or are they better than than the guys that maybe have a little more experience? Then we'll, we have to make that decision. But I'm glad that some of these kids have stepped in and and pushed our veterans for a spot, and that's a good thing. That's a very positive thing. But nor has a veteran played his way off the team, so that's just important as well. So, uh, do we have a lot of work to do between now and October 11th? Absolutely, we do. We're not kidding ourselves. Uh, because of the because of the delay in getting the lines together, the delay in getting everyone feeling strong out in practice, um, so uh, there's there's progress made in in what you're talking about for sure. All right, so there's a little bit more from head coach Rick Bonus. Jets, Ottawa Senators tomorrow, final preseason game. If you joined us late, Billy Hainal was paired with Brendan Dillon today. Nate Schmidt paired with Logan Stanley, Samberg and Pionk together, and Morrissey and DeMello, Declan Chisholm working in throughout it as uh, looks like, at least uh, from today's practice, the uh, the ninth defenseman. Uh, all right, let's get to the cool bet lines. We've got a game coming up shortly. Rima, what do you think? Can the Blue Jays, uh, can the Blue Jays start a new losing streak for the Twins and get this one to three? Uh... Yeah, let's go. Yeah, we're in Canada. A lot of Jays fans here. They're going to have to get the bats going. And I saw some people in chat saying, well, they've done this all year. Why do we think it's going to be any different? Well, it's baseball, you know, one game sample size. Anything can happen. You know they have hitters that can hit. I think they're in a real tough matchup. I mean, Sonny Gray has been very strong this year, but Jays countering with another great pitcher in Jose Barrios. So... Uh, it's going to be interesting. Three thirty-eight, first pitch. Yeah, Jays plus one twenty-seven, Twins minus one forty-three. Uh, so the Jays a pretty big underdog. If you're still feeling, if you're still feeling the Jays, if you believe that they can come back after losing Game One to win the series, plus three twenty-five is the number on the Blue Jays to win the next two games over at Cool Bet. Uh, other games today, I did just fire up the Cool Bet play of the day on the Cool Bet socials. I like the Phillies to sweep the Marlins. Phillies with Aaron Nola on the hill, minus 149. Brewers, minus 130 favorites against the Arizona Diamondbacks. And uh, as we mentioned, the Rays and Rangers going at it right now. That was a bit of a surprise yesterday. The Rays sh- uh, the Rays getting shut out by Texas. Uh and they're now into the fourth. They still have not scored a run in this series, Reem. Yeah, and the Rays got off to that really hot start. We thought they were going to run away with it. They kind of faltered a little into the wild card spot. That's why they play 162 us, and it was the Orioles uh, who ended up winning the division. So uh, curious uh, how that's going to work here with the Rays. They got, what, top of four now, down 1-0. Still a lot of time left. I think a lot of concerns about the Rangers bullpen. Yeah, Rays a little sloppy in that one uh, one yesterday, and uh, and the D backs beat the Brewers as well. Uh, yeah. Also, I mean Milwaukee with a ninety two win season, the Rays with a ninety nine win season, both facing elimination today in their games, along with the Toronto Blue Jays. So uh, there are your lines for the baseball that's getting underway this afternoon. 
A uh, little bit of line movement. I'm not surprised in the CFL. Bombers opened up as two-point underdogs in BC, plus 112 on the money line. Uh, they're now plus 105 to win and one-and-a-half-point underdogs. I got to think, Rio, there's going to be some more money coming in on the Bombers. I think that this game might be a one-point spread, maybe even half or closer to a pick by the time things get going. So I do think that if you just want to bet the Bombers to win, I think you're better off doing it right now because I think that number might go down as people remember who the Bombers are and the gravity of this situation and expect the best out of the uh, three-time defending Western champs. Yeah, they've shown they can uh, show up for these big games when their back's against the wall. And uh, I think this is going to, you know, we think it's going to be a great game, but the two games they played this year were blowouts, although Vernon Adams Jr. not in the lineup for that second game that was here where the Bombers put up 50. So uh, looking forward to it. Great. I love, you know what, I said at the beginning of the year how disappointed I was in the CFL for taking away the Saturday night summer doubleheader. And uh, now they just do the 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock instead of the 6, 9. But I love this October Friday Night Football, Huss. Uh, yep. 6 o'clock, and we get the late one with the Bombers. Uh, I'm pumped. So, uh, Yeah, no line on that, uh, what is it, Edmonton-Toronto game? Um, I guess they, like, they don't know what, what's going to happen with exactly. Toronto's lineup. Din Whistle doesn't want to let everyone know who's playing and what they're going to do. So uh, that one's off the board. Tie Cats are three and a half point underdogs in Saskatchewan. And then uh, a Thanksgiving Day noon game on Monday. Ottawa and Montreal going back at it. Montreal seven point favorites mm. against the Ottawa Red Blacks. And CFL futures right now, by the way, Bombers, like if you still are a blue believer and think that the Bombers will win the Grey Cup, this is the best number we've seen of the Bombers for months. Um, Toronto is the clear favorite right now at plus 120. And the Bombers, who were kind of plus 150 for a good part of the season, they're now two to one. So if you do want to get in and make a little wager on the Bombers to get back to the top of the mountain, now might be a good time to do that as well to win the 110th Grey Cup. Bombers 2-1, to one, BC plus 350, and the Argos the favorite at plus 120. And just a quick look at the NFL. The Washington Commanders, five and a half point favorites tomorrow night in Thursday night football against the Chicago Bears. I'm glad it's such a dog Thursday nighter, um, so I won't have to really care or pay too much attention to it while we're at the game tomorrow night, seeing the Jets take on the Sens. Yeah, we will be there checking out, uh, you know, some of the new areas that they've improved look really cool last time. But Jets ends and at Thursday. Yeah, I'm not going to. This game is pretty mal, although maybe Justin Fields has turned a corner. He looked pretty good last week, although the Broncos, their defense, uh, I don't know, they're <laughs> looking like one of the worst all-time oh. us, giving up 70. And I'm laughing at Sean Payton came in, like, talking smack on uh, Nathaniel Hackett and... I mean, they've taken a huge step back, the Broncos. So what a what a mess. And that's the matchup this week, eh? Nathaniel Hackett's oh, it, new team, the New York Jets, in <laughs> Denver to take on the Broncos. And the Broncos are only one-and-a-half-point favorites against Zach Wilson and the Jets. Oh, man, go, Zach, Jets, go. Go, Jets, Zach go in Wilson. that one. And I'm talking about the NFL Jets. Gang Green going into Denver to take on the Broncos. Uh, Chiefs four-point favorites over the Vikes on that Sunday afternoon game that I'm going to be at. A great Sunday nighter. Cowboys and 49ers next week. That'll be a fun one to uh, lean into after uh, we watch Mahomes and the Chiefs take on the Minnesota Vikings. Monday nighter is Green Bay in Vegas to take on the Raiders. Packers one-point favorites. Of course, if you haven't bet a cool bet before, Use the promo code WST for a 100% bonus on your first deposit up to 200 bucks, And make sure to join myself and Dustin Nielsen daily before Winnipeg Sports Talk at 12 noon over on the Edmonton Sports Talk channel with the latest episodes of The Lock Shop. Uh, good show today. I appreciate DT coming on. Uh, fun to get ready for the hockey season with Greg Wyshynski and Always great with Murata Tesh. He's so popular for obvious reasons with the listeners. Oh, everyone just gushing over Murata and chat how much uh, they love when he comes on. And that was certainly a great rundown of what's been happening in Winnipeg Jets training camp as we approach the last preseason game 
Uh, a couple. One thing we didn't touch on, Huss, was the uh, NHL announced their waiver wire and a couple familiar names to Jets fans. Uh, and Leon Gavanka, who was traded to San Jose in the summer, you know, was frustrated that he didn't get an NHL opportunity here, signed in Germany, but he got uh, sent down but from San Jose. But you wonder with how bad San Jose is and their AHL team also plays in the same arena. You wonder if he will have a better shot there getting that uh, chance in the NHL. And how about Nick Patan, Minnesota, putting him on waivers? Remember the... We remember we had a lot of conversations. I wonder, about Nick is Patan. there a free Patan movement in Minnesota right now? I'm I'm not, I'm not sure, but he was he was uh, put on waivers as well, and uh, the Jets placing Jeffrey Biel on waivers, and we'll find out tomorrow who clears. As uh, 1 p.m. is what when they all the insiders tweet out the announcements. Yeah, uh, Rob Mahoney and chat. Kirk Cousins and Mahomes each throw for 700 yards and eight eight TDs each. Uh, there'd be a lot of happy fantasy owners if that was the case. That might be the the game that you want to uh, stack in your DraftKings lineup, Rob. Yes. Kevin Kowala, Huss, uh, you driving or flying down to Mini for the game? Actually taking a bus. Um, we had a great deal on a bus package earlier in the summer, and thank God we did um, because the price was great on it. It includes you know, getting there, two nights in the hotel, get you to the game, get you back to the game if you want to go back afterwards. Other you can just Uber. Um, and then... Don't have to worry about driving on the way home. Can just sort of zonk out on the bus on the way back. But um, the the ticket prices for this game already were one of the most de- in demand games in the last ten years uh, in in Minnesota. And then as we talked with Jesse Pierce yesterday, the uh, hysteria over Taylor Swift joining the Chiefs Kingdom I think has cranked those tickets up even a little bit more. But uh, yeah, we'll be in the Upper Bowl in that game. It should be a lot of fun. I know plenty of Winnipeggers coming down. Remo, I don't know if I told you this, though. Um, one development about the weekend that I'm even more looking forward to now, not as much as the Chief Vikings, but um, they flexed the Minnesota-Michigan game to Saturday night. So we should get in around 4 or 4.30, and uh, kickoff for that game is at 6.30. Um, so we're going to get to see that stadium, and... Uh, Maybe see Jim Harbaugh go completely uh, mental on the sidelines, although his team's pretty damn good. They're the number two team in the country right now and a heavy favorite in that game. Yeah, I actually went to... Uh, wait, it's not a TC Bank. Is, is it called TC Bank? No, that's the big... What's it's the not, college it's stadium not called? called? TC, it's not called TCF Field anymore, I don't think. It's called, Well, it says on ESPN, Huntington Bank Stadium. Is that what it's called? No, anyways, I went there yeah. when they hosted the Vikings when they were in between stadiums. That was a lot of fun, and... Man, you got lucky with there with a nice, nice double header. Uh, so uh, should be a fun weekend. Love going down to Minneapolis. Scalp for Swift, uh, Doug Phil. <laughs> I will not be scalping anything. And David Zirk, mini dress trips are the best. Heavy, heavy drinking. Hope you're up for it, Huss. Uh, you don't have to. It'll mm-hmm. be a fun time. I've done a couple of them before. And, you know, I guess the, the one that I went on originally, I was hosting Monday Night Footballs at the Pint uh, back in the old station days. And uh, they had an awesome promo where we got to give away a trip for two every Monday night. Um, and then they, uh, you know, included me in the trip and I got to go down with all of our winners. And I'll be honest, I was really psyched out uh, at the thought of being on a bus, uh, just, you know, not really having control over when you want to go and stop or whatever. Uh, it, it ended up being amazing. I mean, it was really fun on the way down, very well organized. And, um, and man, I was not upset about not having to drive back on Monday after a uh, plenty of fun on game day in uh, the Twin Cities. So um, anyways, uh, it's a perfect time, too, with Thanksgiving. Monday being Monday, um, no show, so we can kind of get back. And then one day on Tuesday here in Winnipeg, and then Tuesday night, get out to Calgary and get ready for game number one of 82 for the Winnipeg Jets. It's going to be a fun, oh. fun week. Yeah, speaking of NHL, there was a, I, I don't know if you saw this note yesterday. ESPN had a conference call to tee up the season, and I'm very excited for this. Um, on October 24th, ESPN is having something on their streaming ESPN Plus called Frozen Frenzy where that is the day, has October 24, where every team plays in staggered start times. So they start yeah. 15 minutes apart. I think the Jets play the Blues that night. It's at 7.45 yeah. p.m. Uh, and then that's here. So I'm actually I'm like 7.45. That's a great time for me to go. So I'll be there. But but um, 
they're going to be doing like a red zone style show hosted by John Buchagross, where they cool. show every goal. Um, like, you know, they do in red zone, make sure you show every touch and they'll be going from game to game showing, I think power plays would be key. And if you're like, if you're doing fantasy or, uh, you have any bets or you're just like well, watching. I'm as just many thinking games. about the lock shop that day and about all of our options mm-hmm. for parlays. Like I'm going to be, yeah. Like, uh, you know how many DraftKings uh, lineups or, or whatever you want to do, like over unders. But, uh, I think this is going to be, I hope we get it in Canada if it's on the SN now premium. Because I really, like, I've been dying for these staggered start times. It's so frustrating when, like, every game starts at 6, and you got to wait till 7, and then it's, like, 6.45. Every game is in intermission at the same time. Like, it's, I don't know, like, a lot of us are at home with the package trying to watch all the games. So if this is a success and takes off, apparently this is something that ESPN wanted. And uh, look... You know, you know, search it up. So they revealed that on a conference call, and I wanted to mention that because I'm looking for it. If you've got multiple TVs, that's going to be a great night, too. I love seeing multiple TV setups. I know uh, Jeremy is always posting his in the Discord, and other people t- tweet them at me. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the 24th um, has. Watch out for that. Looking forward to that one. Uh, and as I said, we got... Uh, a few things to do before that. Start the season off in uh, Calgary. Have the big home opener on October 14th. Get your tickets for that one. And our first WST night with the return of Pierre-Luc Dubois. And then it's Vegas two nights later. Um, th- that first week of the season is going to be really fun with uh, you know, some pretty big-time teams coming in, all of which who were in the playoffs last year. And a great chance to see uh, our team for the first three times on a home ice. Uh, all right, that's going to do it. It's uh, just a shout out to Dan in chat or in chat and at the game and uh, any other WSTers that are popping in on the program while they get ready for first pitch tomorrow. Uh, don't forget, gang, we are so close to 10,000 subs. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button on YouTube. We greatly appreciated it. And uh, tell a friend about WST and uh, where they can subscribe and where they can join us every day live at 1 p.m. And, of course, don't forget those podcast downloads. Uh, subscribe to the pod at Winnipeg, or well, wherever you get your favorite podcast. All the links at winnipegsportstalk.com. Uh, big thanks to the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Thank you to Michael Remus, and thank you to Greg Wyshynski, Murata Tesh, and CGOB's Derek Taylor, voice of the Bombers. And most of all, thanks to all of you for having a great day with us today here in the Winnipeg Sports Talk chat. Um, Go Jays, go. Fingers crossed. We've got a game to talk about tomorrow. Uh, Win or lose, though, for the Blue Jays, it'll be a Jets game day program getting ready for the final preseason game. We'll kick it off tomorrow, 1 p.m., right here on WST. Oh, my God. Shut it down. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.